Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Getty Villa. Um, whether you're joining us here in person or from near and far on Zoom, um, it's wonderful to see so many of you here today, both in person and online, uh, for our program, The Egyptian Book of the Dead for the Living. My name is Sarah Cole. I'm an assistant curator of antiquities here at the Villa, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land Getty inhabits today was once known as Tovangar, the home of the Gabrielino Tongva people. We show our respects to the Gabrielino Tongva people, as well as all First People, past, present, and future, and honor their labor as the original caretakers of this land. Getty commits to building relationships with the Gabrielino Tongva community, and we invite you to acknowledge the history of this land and join us in caring for it on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples with honor and respect for the deep history of this region. So that brings me to the subject of today's program, which is related to our current special exhibition, The Egyptian Book of the Dead. This exhibition features highlights from the Getty's own collection of Book of the Dead manuscripts, which are now on view for the first time ever. A group of 19 Egyptian Book of the, Man uh, Book of the Dead manuscripts were donated to the Getty in 1983, 40 years ago, and only now are some of them on public display. I began working on a broader goal of bringing this collection to greater public attention back in 2017, and a high priority was to have these manuscripts fully translated and published together as a collection, which had never been done before. So for this, I reached out to our first speaker today, who's Dr. Foy Scalf at the University of Chicago. And Dr. Scalf has spent the last few years carefully translating, studying, and analyzing our manuscripts and preparing a major publication of this material that will appear about a year from now as an online open access publication from Getty Publications. So keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, I wanted to bring highlights from this collection to the public in the form of an exhibition. I had many conversations and email exchanges with Foy while developing this exhibition, and a recurring theme that kept coming up was that these texts, although we call them the Book of the Dead, and they were used in funerary contexts, are not just about death, and they were not just for the dead. They in fact have much to do with daily life in ancient Egypt, and they provide us with information about the Egyptian worldview and about Egyptians' daily practices, concerns, and beliefs. So the goal of today's program is to take the Book of the Dead out of the tomb and to look at its uses and meanings beyond funerary contexts. How were these texts a book for the living? We have a lineup of wonderful speakers who will address the variety of ways in which the knowledge and information contained in the Book of the Dead was used by and had significant meaning for different constituencies in ancient Egypt as well as today. So now I'll introduce our first panel of speakers. Um, if you have questions, please hold them to the end because we will have a group Q&A discussion after all of the presentations have been given rather than taking questions after each individual talk. Our first speaker, whom I've already mentioned, is Dr. Foy Scalf. Dr. Scalf is head of research archives at the Institute for the Study of Ancient Cultures of the University of Chicago. He studies the intersection of ancient peoples, texts, and beliefs. His recent books include the edited catalog, Book of the Dead, Becoming God in Ancient Egypt. And he's currently working on catalogs of Book of the Dead manuscripts for us here at the Getty, as well as Williams College. Our second speaker will be Dr. Marissa Stevens, the Assistant Director of the Portavud Center for the Study of the Iranian World at UCLA. Trained as an Egyptologist who studies the materiality, social history, and texts of the Third Intermediate Period and Late Period, her research interests focus on how objects solidify, maintain, and perpetuate social identity, especially in times of crisis when more traditional means of self-identification are absent. And the third speaker in our first panel today is Dr. Jonathan Winterman, who is an academic administrator in ancient studies and the assistant director of global antiquity at UCLA. 
A specialist in ancient Egyptian philology and visual culture, his research focuses on the construction and maintenance of kingship and power across ancient, pre-modern, and contemporary worlds. And before joining UCLA, Jonathan worked in Egypt for many years, most notably as an epigrapher with the Epigraphic Survey in Luxor and with the Tel Edfu Project. So please join me in welcoming our first panel of speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out tonight. First thing I want to do is congratulate and thank the Getty first on a wonderful exhibition. If you haven't seen it yet, it's very beautiful, so please stick around and see it. But the other thing I want to say is I really want to thank Sarah. She's really been a relentless advocate for these manuscripts that have been, in a way, hiding here at the Getty. And what we'll talk about a little bit tonight is that this is actually one of the most significant collections of this type of manuscripts, not just in the United States, but in fact in the Western Hemisphere that stretches the entire time period of the production and use of the Book of the Dead and has lots of interesting features. So I really want to thank Sarah. In fact, I wouldn't be working on these manuscripts uh, over the last few years without her invitation. So thank you very much for, for that advocacy, Sarah. So everyone here, you're here probably, you already know in some sense, you have an idea of what you think the Book of the Dead is. And because of the Getty's significance of their collection and scope, we can use these manuscripts to help unravel some of those ideas that you have. And if anything, what I hope to do in my short presentation today is help you nuance and perhaps reorient your conceptualizations of what the Book of the Dead was versus what the Book of the Dead is. And I'll talk more about that as we go. Now, the Getty Book of the Dead collection, as I mentioned, is incredibly significant. And perhaps one of the stars of the show is the papyrus of Pasher Ashaket, which you see here on the screen. Something, an image that you're probably all very familiar with, the judgment scene uh, from these ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead manuscripts, where the heart of the owner of the manuscript is weighed against the feather of righteousness so that they can enter into uh, basically the following, the court of Osiris and the other gods. Just as a sort of preview, the spiritual part of the Book of the Dead text is really about joining with these eternal figures, these gods, which some of my other colleagues like Rita Lucarelli this afternoon will be talking more about. And this is actually a really nice uh, scene here. I'll try to, let's see if I can... Can I point at anything here? Maybe, maybe not. On the hieroglyphic text right above the man that you see being let in, that's Pasher Ashaket. And by the way, we're trying very hard in, in this exhibit. Sarah did really took a lot of conscious effort to center the ancient individuals. So I'm going to be referring to these as the papyrus of and then the individual's name to keep their identity centered in these rather than, let's say, a museum number or something like that. But here you see on the right, Pasher Ashaket coming into the court of Osiris, and right above his head in hieroglyphs it says, his heart is well upon the scale. There is no fault that has been found. And Osiris here sitting over on your left, above him the hieroglyphs say, recitation by Osiris, and then he says, Welcome in peace to the beautiful West. So you can see here Pasha Ashaket, the owner of this papyrus, entering into the company of the gods. And so for many of you, this type of scene is probably very familiar. This is what the Book of the Dead is about for you. This is something we often call uh, the illustration for spell number 125. We can talk about those numbers later if you are interested. But of course, the Book of the Dead was and is much more than that. There's many other scenes on these types of papyri, like the one you see here, perhaps also familiar to some of you from a spell that we've given the number 110. And this illustration again shows Pasha Ashaket, Pasha Ashaket in the afterlife in a place called the Field of Reeds, or also sometimes called the Field of Offerings. And he's plowing, the grain grows easily, it grows you know, as high as a human being, and he's reaping that grain. Now, you probably have some ideas about what this is about, and I hope by the end of my presentation here that we can again correct some of this. But these are just little pieces, literally vignettes of the Book of the Dead, and don't explain the true richness and diversity of a manuscript like the papyrus of Pasha, Pasher Ashaket, which is not only a couple of these illustrations, but includes many texts in between, and in fact is a nearly 10 foot long papyrus scroll that you will see in the exhibit if you go to visit it. So these texts 
that we find in this, what we call the Book of the Dead, are quite diverse and nuanced. Now, the Gettys collection spans the entire time of the ancient production and use of the Book of the Dead. So their earliest manuscript is from about 1450 BC. This belonged to a woman named Webinesre. Also, just to give you, um, to make sure you understand, the pictures that I'm gonna show on this slide are not to scale. I'm just showing you the overview of the collection. So this is one of the earliest ones. So this is a little bit before, let's say, the time of King Tut. And very early on in the Book of the Dead manuscript tradition, they have three manuscripts from about 500 years later from the time that's called the Third Intermediate Period in Egypt. By the way, all four of these manuscripts belong to women. The owners of these ancient four papyri here were all women. And in fact, the three in the center were all women who worked as singers or musicians in the temple of the god Amun at Karnak. And then they have three further papyri that's from the Ptolemaic period, so somewhere around 250 BC or 200. Um, these, all three of these belong to other men. Now, these are the papyrus examples that they have, but what's great about the Gettys collection is that they show you the range and diversity on which these texts were produced, which will be another point that we'll come back to in a minute. So they also have here at the Getty a collection of 12 linen bandages that at one time in ancient Egypt were wrapped around someone's human remains. And then that later in the 19th uh, century, these were torn away and sold on the antiquities market. We don't know now what happened to the human remains. And these 12 bandages belong to three different individuals. So you can see here how they've been grouped under that. And I should say, other pieces of these linen bandages now exist at dozens of collections all throughout the world. So we have other pieces from London, from New Zealand, from uh, Italy, all over in private collections, and some that we can't track down still, that we know were sold in the 19th and 20th century, that all belong to these collections. In addition, they have one final piece that Sarah already showed you. They had the Ushapti, this little figurine at the bottom of Neferibre Sadnith from Dynasty 26. But here's a general point to take away. The Gettys collection shows you that the Book of the Dead was not a book, not solely on papyrus in the way that we tend to think of books. This material was written on any available surface. So when you look at ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead text, you find them on tomb walls, you find them on figurines, you find them on boxes, you find them on coffins, you find them written right on the mummy shroud, you find them written on papyri, anything that you can write on, they're writing these texts on. So part one, the Book of the Dead is not a book in the typical sense that we tend to think of it. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. Now this really amazing collection, this significant collection, uh, was put together by a single individual, and Sarah hinted at this already a little bit before. This was all collected in uh, the 19th century by a man named Sir Thomas Phillips. Now, Sir Thomas Phillips is famous for having an enormous book and manuscript collection, something like 100,000 books and manuscripts, and I, and I wanna acknowledge here that the Getty's own Judith Barr has done the most research on this provenance about these pieces in the, Getty, uh, in the Phillips collection. And so he was collecting this material basically as part of book history. So he's collecting all these medieval manuscripts and earlier material, and this was some of the earliest books in the world, right? We're competing basically with, if anybody in here is a Mesopotamian specialist, right, with clay tablets inscribed with cuneiform, some of this stuff from ancient Egypt is on par with that kind of antiquity, going back to the earliest books that were ever made. And in fact, in ancient Egypt, we have the earliest illustrated books that were ever made in human history. You don't really get a lot of illustrations in cuneiform tablets, so we're really lucky to have that iconographic range. Now, Sir Thomas Phillips, so he's collecting this as part of this larger collection, and what you might think is that in every case he was really sort of treasuring these items, <laughs> but I just wanted to prepare you, because here are some of the bookshelves <laughs> from <laughs> Thomas Phillips' collections that still exist. These are in the Grolier Club today in New York. And he had a special modular system that he had designed. <laughs> and these were things that, if he didn't get around to them, they sort of got shoved into uh, the cubby holes. Okay, now, this isn't true of all of his material, but this is what was left of his shelving systems. And the reason I point that out is the Getty Collection has some vestiges of these collecting practices, of how people approach this material in the 19th century when they were collecting it. So just to give you a couple of quick examples, this is the papyrus of Pahor, and I should say, right, in the, in the exhibition, you're gonna see a selection of these manuscripts. I'm talking about um, the larger collection here at the Getty. 
And you can see that it's broken at the top. And recently, actually just this year, even though we've been working on this catalog for a couple years, we were able to identify that this is actually the bottom of a papyrus that's now in the British Museum. And so here is the top of the papyrus and how it lines up. And the crazy part about this is that when I figured out that this papyrus at the top joined here, I called Sarah and I said, Sarah, we need to flip the other papyrus over because I think it's going to have writing on the back. And when we did, yes, indeed, it had writing and not just writing, but another judgment scene from Spell 125 that you see on the bottom. And in fact, this discovery is so new, it's why we only have this photograph uh, snapped here at the bottom. We haven't had, uh, the Getty hasn't had time to take the high-res photography for that. So these two pieces were broken and then sold as two separate parts. Now, one option for that is it's possible that in the 19th century, a dealer cut this piece in half in order to make more money to sell the two pieces, right? Because then you have a nice piece with the judgment scene on the bottom, you can sell that for more, and then the piece at the top, which you maybe sell for less because it's more just text. The other potential possibility, although it's a little bit uncertain, is that the reason that this is written on both sides, most of these papyri don't have writing on both sides. It's kind of unusual to have uh, two sides like this. This is the complete width of the papyrus, so it's only a couple of feet long. It's possible that this was actually rolled up and folded when it was put inside the uh, mortuary materials, for example, in a coffin, uh, or maybe in the mummy wrappings, and then when it was pulled out, that fold created that break all the way down the middle of the papyrus after it was rolled up. And so now these two pieces are across the pond, one in the British Museum, and then the other half here in the Getty. And this is, this is literally results that are two months old. <laughs> We've just been uh, dealing with this in the last couple months. But this is the type of activity that we see with these collectors at the time, is that they were kind of taking these things apart and selling them in various parts. And perhaps the best example that we have is this papyrus here in the Getty, the papyrus of Nesmin. Now, to all of you looking at it, you think, okay, it's a little beat up on the top and bottom, but substantially it's intact. Well, some of my colleagues here who are experts in this material, if you look closely, what you actually find out is that this isn't one piece of papyrus at all. It's over a dozen pieces of papyrus that have all been glued together to make it look like it's a full papyrus. And I call your attention to the section number six at the side that has the arrow pointing down. Yeah, that piece was glued in upside down because these people, of course, <laughs> at the time couldn't read this, so they were just pasting the pieces together. And of course, now what we can do with modern technology and the catalog that we're working on is we can take all of these pieces back apart and rearrange them in their original order. So this is where the pieces would actually go when you go to read the text in their original order. And of course, they had all been broken apart and then reassembled. Probably what's happening in this, in my opinion, it's hard to know for sure, but probably what's happening is that this papyrus was probably unrolled without the right conservation treatment. Now, the Getty here, it's the world renowned for their conservators, but uh, let's say Phillips, maybe not so much. <laughs> In fact, um, Judith recently shared with us um, a notebook where uh, there was a letter that Thomas Phillips was writing to Samuel Birch at the British Museum where he said, I've been taking out the linings and ironing them. And I was just shuddering to think of uh, Samuel Birch ironing out and maybe misting <laughs> these ancient linens. Um, but what you have here is somebody probably tried to unroll a very dry, brittle papyrus that crumbled into a bunch of pieces. And a bunch of pieces aren't that valuable, but a full papyrus is. So then what they ended up doing is taking all those pieces and just gluing them back together in essentially a random order to make it look like the papyrus was whole. So when you first look at this, you think, oh, that's a really nice papyrus. And then you look closely and you go, hold on, that doesn't make any sense. Like, the text doesn't work, and you find out that it's this pastiche that's been all put together. So the point here is just to say that these um, objects reflect these different parts of their histories, right? Going all the way back to ancient Egypt to the collection uh, practices of the 19th century and beyond, and now they're here at the Getty where uh, they can get the highest standard of conservation treatment in the world. So what we can then use these texts to do is talk about what was and what is this thing that we call the Book of the Dead. And one thing I wanted to point out is that, in general, you don't learn anything really about death itself in the Book of the Dead. And that name really is talking about books with the dead, right? Books being found with dead people in their mortuary assemblages. So 
there's a number of modern concepts that we often think about or apply to this material that's different than the ancient concepts. Some of these modern concepts are, as I mentioned, the Book of the Dead is a physical book, which, as I said, we have them on papyrus, but we have them on lots of other things. We think of the Book of the Dead as a conceptual whole, and what I'm about to point out to you is that the Book of the Dead is a compilation. So actually, when you read these papyri, you don't read a narrative. It doesn't start once upon a time over here and then say the end. You have a bunch of shorter texts that are all compiled together, one after the other. And they're usually put together in thematic groups, but one text, what I'm gonna call spells in this talk, and we can talk about that term, but one spell may not have anything to do with the spell next to it, right? They're just put into these long compilations. So it's not one thing. When we talk about Book of the Dead, you think of it as a singular, and what I'll show you is that often the Egyptians thought of it as a plural. Also, the Book of the Dead is not a proper title for this material. As I'll show you, the um, Egyptian title for this had a different range, a different quality to it. The Book of the Dead was not focused on death. If anything, it was focused on eternal life. But as Sarah mentioned at the beginning, and just as, this is just to preview some of the things I want to talk about, the Book of the Dead, because it's this compilation, because it's many things put on one papyrus, let's say, it had many contexts. So many of the spells that you find in the Book of the Dead weren't developed for the Book of the Dead. They were developed for some other life application. And then they were later incorporated into the Book of the Dead. So their primary application is in some other part of the ancient Egyptians' life. So it's not about death per se. Again, because we use this term because it was books with the dead that were being found, not because the texts are about dying. In fact, the ancient Egyptians don't like to talk about death. They write these texts down because they want the text to help bring in eternal existence, right? They want the text to be performative. The texts do things. You're not going to write about dying because you don't want that to actually happen. So you write about eternal life. You write about these other things. So the Book of the Dead doesn't tell us really anything about, let's say, uh, in this case, Pahor. This is the papyrus of Pahor. We don't learn about Pahor's death or anything like that. We learn about their spiritual existence and other ritual material. Also, these texts are not canonical. So the scribes who are writing these didn't treat each word like you can't change it. Every one of the Gettys collections is a unique piece, different than every other piece in the world, because these are handmade. They're one of a kind. Every manuscript in the world of the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead is different from every other one. Some only have one spell. Some have 165 spells. And they all have changes that the scribes make as they try to grapple with the meaning of what these spells say. So it's not a canonical text. Also, we tend to privilege the papyrus copies. And I'll admit, I'll admit, I'm probably privileging them a little bit in this talk myself. But they're not the primary copies. In fact, there are not primary copies because the primary thing is that you say these things out loud. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. And often you think of the, and myself as well, we think of the Book of the Dead as a guide to the afterlife. And I want to assure you, okay, it has elements of a guide to the afterlife, but that's not the only thing it is. It's much wider than that. And it's not really developed as leading you through the afterlife or leading you through to a spiritual existence. There's pieces of it like that, but most of it, in fact, is not. Now, a lot of these modern concepts then that we carry around in our minds about the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead are obviously um, reflective of media that we've uh, consumed. <laughs> so a lot of these ideas you might get from things like this, where uh, the protagonists are reading from books of magic themselves, right? Good Lord, these spells have to work. They must, or else nothing can stop the monster, nothing, right? And just to abuse you of any other notions, by the way, the ancient Egyptians did not believe their mummies got up and walked around and choked people. So uh, that's a whole different lecture, but let me just assure you that that's not what they believed. The mummy stayed in the tomb, and it was your Osirian vessel, your form of Osiris. So we've been influenced by this kind of things, where we have magical spells that reanimate the dead, right? And that really has its origins in modern culture from the 1932 mummy movie, where you had the scroll of Thoth introduced. By the way, the scroll of Thoth in the movie, which, you know, the unwitting archaeological assistant reads from and brings Imhotep back to life, the mummy, it actually, in the movie, was based on a real Book of the Dead papyrus. So what you see at the bottom right is the Book of the Dead of Hunefer in the British Museum and the facsimile used in the opening of the movie there in the center. 
But this is just a very entertaining way <laughs> to get you to think about how we're influenced by this material. So what I want you to think about is when we say Book of the Dead, it's a modern thing. Not that the Book of the Dead didn't or doesn't exist. It's a modern conceptualization that was started in the middle of the 19th century in 1842, and it's how we think of these ancient materials. The ancient Egyptians had a different phrase that they used to describe this material. They called it the Ra'u Nu Peru uh, Imheru, so the spells of going out in the day. Those two things, the ancient conceptualization of this material and the modern, they're both real, but they don't have a one-to-one -one overlap. They overlap in certain areas, but not in others. So our conceptualization, for example, of the Book of the Dead as singular is different than when the Egyptians usually think about it as the ra'u, the plural spells of going out in the day. And I just want to point out, they also can call this a mejot, a scroll of going out in the day. So they can refer to this as a singular collection. But just to show you some examples of this where you'll tend to read in popular materials, online, social media, popular science kind of materials, though people will say, don't refer to it as the Book of the Dead. The real name is the spells of going out in the day. And it's like a, they scored some points against you, right? You don't use the Book of the Dead. Well, what I want to impress on you is that spells of going out in the day was also not the name for all of this. Here's spells of going out in the day for one particular spell. This is written on one of the Getty bandages here, the bandage of Nanef Bostet. And you can see this one particular spell just has this at the beginning. In fact, this is a great spell, by the way. This is spell number 64. And what this spell is usually called, if you really want redundancy and backup, this is called the spell for knowing the spells in one spell. <laughs> so if you really want to make sure you got all your bases covered, you use spell 64. But the scribe in this particular part, he just called this one spell the spells of going out in the day. And in fact, that phrase, spell of going out in the day, it's not just used in what we call the Book of the Dead. So many of you probably know that there were earlier um, religious texts in ancient Egypt. We call them coffin texts, pyramid texts. Well, when you go back to those, what you find out is that spell of going out in the day is used for any religious text in ancient Egypt. So, for example, all of those coffin text spells, those numbers, they're called spells of going out by day. All of these Book of the Dead spell numbers, they can sometimes be called spell of going out by day. The Book of the Amduat, the Book of Breathing, all of these religious texts can be called a spell of going out by day. So what does that tell you? It tells you that that is not a technical title. It's a descriptive title. It tells you what these spells do. It tells you what they're about. It doesn't tell you a little box, that only things in this box are from that collection. So it's not a technical title, it's a descriptive title, which is different than how we think of Book of the Dead as a very specific thing, right? Because the fact is, there's actually spells in the Book of the Dead that we're still finding, we just don't number them anymore because the numbers reach 200 and it sort of seems silly to keep giving them numbers. There's constant new, unique spells that are really part of the Book of the Dead that we're finding all the time. So. There's a difference between our conceptualization, born in the middle of the 19th century, Book of the Dead, versus these ancient conceptualizations, right? So for the ancients, going out in the day is not a conceptual book. It's not one composition. It's not one narrative, right? It's this compilation of these smaller compositions. It's not a technical title. It's more a descriptive category or a function, right? Because when we're talking about going out by day, what we're talking about is the soul's ability to leave the tomb join with the sun god and cross the sky, and then at night come back to the tomb and join with your mummy, because your mummy is your Osirian form. While you're doing that, the sun is joining with its Osirian form, the god Osiris, so that it can resurrect in the morning. The god Osiris is the personification of the power of rejuvenation, so you need that to come back up in the morning. So it's not a technical title, it's a descriptive title. Also, it has no stable canon, meaning there's Time periods where it's a little bit more standardized than others, but every manuscript is different. And we can see when you read these, and you read these texts closely, the scribes are grappling with the meaning too. And sometimes they're changing it, and they're making it better. They're, they're adding to it, they're elaborating on it uh, as they go. So it's not a completely stable canon. Slightly standardized, but not completely stable. Also, the papyrus copies were secondary. So number one, because a lot of these spells were used in everyday life in other situations, but also number two, because what I'll explain more in a minute, is all of these were recitations that you said out loud. Writing them down 
was a secondary step. So all of you probably have heard that the Book of the Dead in ancient Egypt, you could only get it if you had money. You had to be rich, right? These things were expensive manuscripts. It doesn't cost you anything to say a spell out loud. It doesn't cost you anything to recite a prayer. So even for people who could not afford the backup of writing these down, for having the spell, for knowing all the spells in one spell, you, your family, can recite these prayers on your behalf. This theology is open to everyone in ancient Egypt. I implore you to take that away uh, tonight. Everyone in ancient Egypt had access to this material, whether written or spoken. Again, the going out in the day was not about death, and it was not only a guide for the afterlife. Just to show you how at the core of this are these spoken recitations here on the very text that we're looking at in this particular uh, papyrus, we see this phrase, one will say this spell while being pure. It means going out in the day after mooring. So you can see in the red there, the rubricized part, these sections of the text written in red that are sort of like punctuation. They're guideposts to guide you through trying to read or write these texts. And it calls this thing, this spell. That's how these, uh, or in maybe in, in less or more neutral terminology, you might say utterance, this recitation, this utterance you're gonna say. So number one, that's what each of these individual compositions are called, and that's why the whole compilation is called the spells of going out in the day, because you put them one after the other. And also at the heart of the entire Book of the Dead is recitations. Recitations that you say out loud. You make your papyrus copy if you have the money, because you say, what can I do to help assuage my mortal anxiety? What's going to happen when I die? Well, I can take some agency in that. I can purchase one of these papyri, write down these spells for me, and that's going to help. If you don't have the money, that's fine. You just say them out loud, because they're all utterances. They're all spells. Here are examples from the papyrus of Nesmut. You'll see very similar papyri on display. This is the third of those uh, third intermediate period manuscripts I mentioned before. Also, Osset and uh, Ankes and Osset's papyrus are up in the gallery. And you can see all the parts that are highlighted in red here. These are the spells of, followed by some kind of uh, descriptive phrase. So the spell of opening the mouth, the spell of bringing magic to the man in the necropolis, the spell of remembering the name, et cetera, et cetera, the spell of bringing the heart of a man to him, things like that. So the ra'u are the utterances, and each of these are really at their core oral recitations, not primarily written, right? They're, they're spoken. And when you get further evidence of this here from, again, one of the highlights of the exhibit, the papyrus of Pasher Ashaket, where we can see in the highlighted boxes the little phrase in hieroglyphs that says, Jed Medu Yin, recitation by, and then it's followed by the owner's name. That is, they're supposed to recite each of these individual compositions. And you can see how these are a compilation. Here are the numbers, our modern numbering system for the spells that we have in this 78, 79, 81, 85, Surely you're asking, well, where's 82, 83, 84? Again, each of these is unique. When those numbers were applied, it was applied to a different manuscript. Those spells weren't included in this one. But again, at the heart, these are recitations. These are jed medu. These are ra'u. These are spells that you can say out loud. So they're being used by living people in living context. That's the other thing to take away after what Sarah was saying. Remember, these manuscripts are commissioned by individuals. Again, why are they commissioned? If you want to take agency over what might happen to you at the end, here's one way to do it. You can write these spells down. You can take them with you as a physical thing. It basically makes you feel better about what's going to happen at the end. But in addition to that, these spells have a background in the everyday life practices of ancient Egyptians. So this is very much why the theme of today's symposium is a book for the living. What are they doing with these, um, these spells in their everyday lives? And some of my colleagues uh, will talk more about that, Jonathan and Marissa, later today. And just, again, to keep you thinking about this, if these are compilations with either one or maybe hundreds of individual spells on a manuscript, as you might imagine, there's not one context in which those spells were used. So the ritual or everyday context that these spells were being used in were just as diverse as the spell's origins. So let me just give you an example to help bring this home. There's a whole section in the Book of the Dead, the spells in the 30s. And there's spells for things like this. To get rid of snakes. To get rid of crocodiles. <laughs> to get rid of cockroaches. 
Why do we need that in our funerary text, right? This sounds like spells that you would use in the domestic household. And then they're incorporated later because, of course, you don't want cockroaches in your tomb. You don't want to encounter them in the afterlife. You know, you don't want a snake trying to attack you. So you adapt those into the funerary religion and put them in the coffin, right? But they have this origin probably in another area. Here's a great example of this. This is material from my home institution in Chicago. This is what you call a heart scarab. It's inscribed with spell 30B. Again, notice, not just on papyrus, one spell by itself. And next to it is what you can see here is the spell from one of the papyri in our collection back in Chicago. This spell just isn't documented in the Gettys collection, why I didn't use it. But um, what you see here is on the left, an actual amulet with the spell. What you see on the right is the spell. But then notice what you get in the papyrus copy. You get instructions for how to use it. So notice what it says, recitation over a scarab of green stone, purified with gold, put in the place of the heart of a person. May the opening of the mouth be performed for him when he has been anointed with oil. Speak over it as magic. And notice somebody's done a nice job. They use a green stone and they uh, embellished it with uh, gold. Why are these instructions in the papyrus copies? It's because these papyrus copies are secondary. If you can make that amulet, you don't need the instructions. The amulet just has the text of the spell on it. But once you take that spell off of that amulet for which it was designed and put it in a papyrus, where the heck did that come from? So the scribes add the instructions for how to use these in their original ritual context. What this shows to us is that we have an original ritual for producing this amuletic uh, device, right? This heart scarab with text on it. And then when those texts get taken off those original amulets and put in a papyrus, now you need instructions for how they were used. This is very similar to what you saw uh, when I just showed you before from the papyrus of Pahor, where we have instructions, right? One will say the spell. Who's that for? These instructions are for the ritualist, right? The ritualist are producing these. And we have this throughout the Book of the Dead. This has been the subject of recent work in our field by people like Harko Willems, They've written about how we have instructions. For example, there's one spell that says, write the seven Ujat eyes on a papyrus, wash it off and drink it. Well, who's supposed to do that? That's the ritualist. That's somebody here in everyday life. At the end of these spells, they also often tell us that the spell was exceedingly effective on earth. Not just in heaven, right, in the afterlife, not just in some other place, in the Duat, the ancient Egyptian sort of celestial realm, but actually here on earth. So we know that these people are doing these things in real life, right? You wanna get rid of cockroaches? We got something for you. You say this spell, it's gonna help you out. And I just wanna point out, Jonathan's gonna talk a lot about this today. This theology, this practice was shared across all of ancient Egyptian culture. So the things that we think of medicine, magic, etc., they're doing this in all of these, these contexts. So these people are ritual role-playing, right? They're playing the role of ritualist and sometimes taking on, indeed, the identity of God. So, for example, we have really amazing depictions like this. This is from the Temple of Dendera. What you see here are three priests. Notice the one in the middle. If you can't tell what he's doing, he's wearing a mask, and his friend behind him is helping him lead him along because perhaps it's not that easy to see with an Anubis mask on top of your head. And what's even better is that we have actual examples with eye holes. <laughs> Perhaps you can stumble around in this, right? But you can become, right, Anubis. You can become Bess. You can become these gods. That's part of this ritual role play. That's part of where these spells have their origin, right? So one thing that we really want to emphasize today is that the Book of the Dead is not just all about theology and things in the afterlife and death and spirits and let's say spooky monsters, right? <laughs> if you saw the New York Times article this week. But these are things used by living people, right? That they're commissioning them, that they're using them, they're reciting these spells on their own. And in fact, I would also say, somebody asked me recently this, um, well, would people teach their children the Book of the Dead? I said, no, you wouldn't have to. You would learn this as part of living in ancient Egypt the same way you do. When the ancient Egyptians took their kids to the cemetery to pray for their deceased relatives and they said a prayer for them, do you have to teach that to them? They learn it while they're there. They learn it because it's part of their culture. You don't have to teach them the Book of the Dead, right? And I, I should say, 
Of course, some of the spells in the Book of the Dead are pretty esoteric and weird, but there's also many of them that would have had this everyday life experience. They would have just been shared as part of ancient Egyptian culture. So you wouldn't have to bring your kids aside, and, today, kids, we're going to learn the Book of the Dead. No, they learn this as part of celebrating their ancestors, celebrating in their festivals, going into the Feast of the Valley, going into the, the weekly, um, what we call the Decade Feast that happens every 10 days in ancient Egypt, and reciting prayers, especially for their de deceased ancestors, who they believed were gods. They believed they were effective spirits, Aku, who joined with the gods. And just to sort of come back to that, it's not that these uh, materials didn't talk about the spiritual realm. It's just that we've emphasized it so much in our scholarship over the last 150 years that people have sort of forgot about it, and we're sort of trying to bring that back. But of course, they do talk about what the purpose of these spells are, and this from um, the Papyrus of Nesman that I showed you before, that one that was all broken up into pieces and pasted back together. Here's the title for spell two. Uh, notice, by the way, spell of going forth by day. So again, not a title for the whole collection, but this particular spell, but then the most important part, for Ankh im Khetmut, for living after dying. This is sort of part of the spiritual purpose of these spells. And like that early image that I showed you before, where we had this nice uh, vignette, this illustration of spell 110, where we saw Pasher Ashaket in the field of reeds harvesting grain, we often think of this as, it's often presented in pop, popular uh, literature as, let's say, an Elysian field, a sort of paradise in the next world that mimicked the life on earth. And what I want to just suggest to you is this is based on some recent work of a colleague of ours named Rune Yord, who's pointed out that this is sort of a Victorian concept that these Yushabtis, so like the one of Neparib Re Sadnith that's in the gallery upstairs, they were presented in the 19th and early 20th century as little servant figures who were going to come to life and do this agricultural work for you. Because you don't want to do any work in the afterlife, right? You want to retire and like hang out. But the reality is when we read the text for spell 110, and when you actually look at the images, we, we focused on the right side. Okay, the grain grows really tall and we see people uh, doing the agricultural work. But right above that agricultural work, it says very clearly, Seka in Wesir Pasher Ashaket Ma'acheru, the plowing of Osiris Pasher Ashaket, true voice. Who's doing the plowing? It's not servant figures. It's Pasher Ashaket. And what's he doing it for? Well, it's on the left side of the image that we've ignored for so long. He's offering it back to the gods. And among these gods are his ancestors, who are now effective spirits. And in fact, he is also going to be an effective spirit. So what's he actually doing? He's growing the sustenance for himself, his dead family members, and the gods. That's not an activity you want to avoid. <laughs> That's an activity you take pride in, which is why the Yushaptis, on the front of almost all of them, say the owner's name. This isn't something that's replacing you. It's an avatar of you. These are extensions, hypotheses of you, of your personality. When it says in the, tech, the text, O oh, Yushaptis of Neferibre Sadnith, when you're called upon, you will show up. Who are they figures of? Neferibre Sadnith not a servant, not a slave, not somebody to do it for you. This is pious work, the pious work of growing the sustenance for the gods, who include, by the way, your deceased ancestors. And there's a very interesting part of this story that exists almost nowhere else in the world, except for here on a Getty papyrus. You see this in the exhi exhibit upstairs. This is the pi papyrus of Webin S. Ray. At the end, there's this nice illustration. Uh, this is what we call spell 150. It's a number of areas, geographical spaces in the uh, afterlife that you can visit and go across. And they have fanciful descriptions. So the one in the upper, uh, upper left in the red ring, it says the horn of fire, the god who is in it, the razor of braziers, the one who raises fiery cauldrons, right? So it sounds sort of scary. One thing I want to point out is those scary names are not to keep Pasher Ashaket or Webin Esrei out, those are to keep the uninitiated out. They're not to scare the owner of the papyrus, they're to scare the people who shouldn't be part of the realm of the gods, the enemies of the god. So we can't think of these sort of um, ferocious uh, and aggressive, uh, let's say, gods as scary to these owners because the owners had the passport, right? You just show this at the gate, 
You're, come on in. You get to be part of the gods. But as part of this, there's this interesting text here. After spell 149, which is what most of this text is, we have a recitation by the owner, Weben Esrei, when she passes these secret mounds. And she calls out to Osiris, Hail to you, bull of the west, Osiris, foremost of the west, perfect being, ruler of the west. May I come before you, Lord of the gods. I am pure. There is no evil that I have committed. I have not committed wrongdoing. I have made the festival offerings of the gods, it's very much what we're talking about, and the invocation offerings for the ox spirits. I have given bread to the hungry and water to the thirsty. I have done that by which the gods are pleased. May you give to me air to my nose. May I drink water from the river. Two things I want to point out quickly as my time is quickly coming to an end. Number one, these statements of purity, they're what behind, are behind things like, you, many of you have probably heard of the negative confession in Spell 125 where ancient Egyptians would go before gods and say, oh God, I haven't committed X or Y sin, right? Something wrong. That has its origin in priestly oaths. That is in statements of purity before you come before a sacred place. If you're going to go into the hall of Osiris, you better be pure. You better have not defiled anything before you come in. So part one is that's what's going on here. But also, immediately following this, Web and Esrei asks for something else. And in the text, she says, may you endow me with a field of 10 auroras. That's like, you can imagine like an acre, 10 auroras in the field of reeds, just like what is done regarding a field there. 10 auroras is the standard amount that you can uh, plow, that you can produce agriculture on by a single person. So this is Web and Esrae's personal field in the field of reeds where she can grow that sustenance for her deceased ancestors, for herself, for the gods. Again, pious work that she wants to do. She is not trying to have servant figures do this for her. These are avatars of her, expressions of her. So what we have then by looking at the Getty Book of the Dead as an example to help us nuance our ideas of what these texts were in ancient Egypt and are in our own mind, we can take away a few things. First off, the spells of going out in the day, it was a descriptive phrase. It referred to the purpose of the compositions. It was not a technical title or a proper name. It could be a single spell or a huge compilation. It was not a singular narrative composition or a singular, singular book, right? You could have many of these little things on one papyrus. It was not canonical, and it was not really about death, but about the ontology of an everlasting spiritual afterlife as well as continued memorial on earth. In that way, what we can sort of take away from this is that the ancient Egyptian uh, books of the dead were commissioned by living people to give them agency over the unknown. These ancient people recited the spells, participated in rituals, and celebrated religious festivals and as an intrinsic part of their culture. In this sense, the book of the dead was simply part of their lives. The Getty books of the dead are therefore a testament and a, mem and a memorial to these people like Neferibre Sadnith, Pahor, Pashir Ashaket, Pet Osiris, Web and Esrei Aset, and Ankh Esen Aset, whose names we speak uh, with honor and respect against the despoilation of their places of rest centuries ago. And with that, as the papyrus of Web and Esrei says, the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to thank by uh, echoing Foy's remarks on, on thanking the Getty for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you today, and in particular, uh, Sarah Cole for all of her wonderful efforts in putting this event together and the exhibit together as well. And so today, I'm going to be looking at the Book of the Dead as a family affair to see how an Egyptian family might utilize these documents. And I think it'll be in some interesting ways that maybe you're not expecting. Now. The research that I focus on in particular uh, is in a specific time period. So Foy mentioned that the use of the Book of the Dead spans a, a large swath of time starting around 1550 BCE all the way up to around 100 right, BCE. Now I'm looking in particular at the beginning of the third intermediate period at the 21st dynasty. 
uh, and this is, this is the area that I focus on for a lot of my research, and, and there's a large corpus of, of Book of the Dead papyri and other funerary papyri as well from this time period. Now, this time period in Egyptian history is, is noteworthy because it's, it's quite often called a time period of crisis and decentralization. And, and for many reasons, that is, that is an accurate description. So we have in the north of Egypt, pharaohs ruling Egypt from the city of Taunus, the capital city of Taunus. The area in the south is controlled by the high priesthood of Amun at Thebes. And it is here that we have a large group of papyri um, that we can study these, the, the priesthood and the families right, of these priests because this seems to be a time period where there are a lot of hereditary temple titles. Um, but because this is such a decentralized time period, you can imagine what that would do politically, socially, even militarily, right? This is a time where trade routes are breaking down. There's a lot of uh, uh, less international trade and communication, and that means the imports of raw materials and finished goods, luxury items into Egypt, are really breaking down. Now, what this means is that Egyptians are looking inward for resources, and the priesthood in the South in particular um, would loot, reappropriate, reuse a lot of funerary material, and that this caused a lot of changes to burial practices because of this, because people did not want their burials to be disturbed. Um, so what we see happen is the rise of defensive burial practices during this time period of the 21st dynasty. So you see here um, a, a more traditional private tomb of the 19th dynasty of the Ramesid period, the time right before um, the, the, the beginning of the third intermediate period. And, and it is a obvious tomb with a central courtyard. It would have been marked on the landscape. This shifts to burial caches, right, that are hidden in the cliffside, that people do not want to be seen, noticed, um, and, and obviously they do not want them to be disturbed, right? These tombs now become burial caches with many bodies being interred in them, oftentimes uh, being family members, right, so lineages of extended families. And now this decrease in space an increase in bodies interred led to a need for a lot of the decoration that we would have normally seen on tomb walls to be placed elsewhere. So we see coffins shift to have a lot more decoration placed on them uh, as part of these new burial practices that are being quite adaptive. And we also see a rise in funerary papyri being used. So a lot of the content that you would have seen on those tomb walls are now being put on the coffins and the papyri of this time period. So I'm looking at these books of the dead from the 21st dynasty. I have, a, I have 557 papyri in a data set that I study, and it's from that group that I'd like to draw some conclusions today, and we can discuss um, some of the interesting features that I see as relating to how the family of the deceased are utilizing these documents. So the first one is what I have just gone over, that funerary papyri were now being used as a defensive burial practice. Um, right, because they could not preserve the iconography and texts on other places, traditionally like the tomb, they were now being placed on these papyri. But what else can be said? Right, about the Book of the Dead as it pertains to the living. Well, the next thing I'd like to go over is how these papyri were used to preserve individuals' identity. Uh, funerary papyri, I believe, uh, in the 21st dynasty, w w were not created simply in response to a lack of tomb decoration. These were objects that were already in use, right, as Foy has, has shown in his overview. Um, but they also, I think, grew in popularity during this time period as a strategic reaction to coffin reuse, helping to identify the deceased when a coffin did not, right? And now coffin reuse um, is relatively new um, in, in, the, in the Egyptological community as it's been studied, um, and it's one that can be quite disruptive to our modern narratives focusing on things like eternal Egypt. We think of this as something incredibly aberrant. Um, but this was a really widespread phenomenon that was first um, noticed really by Professor Karakuni 
demonstrating that times of economic scarcity and political decentralization, uh, Egyptians would reuse coffins. Sometimes this did extend to outright theft, but more commonly, this seemed to have been a socially acceptable practice that involved members of a family reusing coffins um, in a very uh, respectful way, I would say, um, and, and reusing the, the resources that they felt they had legitimate claim to. Right? And so you can see here, this, this is an example that um, Professor Cooney often shows in her, in her presentations because I think it is so illustrative of these facts of coffin reuse where you can clearly see one layer of decoration over the other. And so I have stolen this from some of her presentations, right? Um, but you can clearly see in this coffin a moot hotep here. Um, other examples are, are things like a name being reused, right? So here's an example, um, that of a coffin of Iset Emheb. But Nessie Konsu, another woman, reused this coffin. And you can see both names visible. So, um, and you, hopefully you can see the name that is secondarily inscribed. You can see how that layer was erased. It's rough. There's discoloration there, right? And here's another example of how papyri come into play with this coffin reuse. So here we have a coffin, um, belong, a coffin set belonging to a woman named Ancus Moot. However, the woman buried inside this coffin set has the name of Is Nessie Isset. And we know this because of the papyrus that was found wrapped in inside her mummy wrappings. When this papyrus was unrolled and read, we saw um, the name Nessie Isset preserved on the papyrus, right? Without that papyrus, we would have no idea who the identity of that woman was. And in fact, Scholars studying this coffin set would have had to have assumed that it was Ankes Moot inside that coffin. So in this case, the only way that, that an, an identity of an individual was able to be preserved was through the papyrus. Another example of this is the a burial assemblage of Gaut Session. Now we know Gaut Session was a mistress of the house, a chantress of Amur, Amun, and singer in the choir of Moot. But we only know this because of the papyri that were included in her assemblage. If we look at her coffin set, we see essentially that it was made for an anonymous man. Um, in addition, um, you can see you know, the male deceased um, depicted many times throughout this coffin set, the only time her name and titles appear on the coffin is a single time on the foot of the outer coffin. Um, otherwise, spaces on this coffin set are left blank for a name, uh, presumably one for a male. But her burial assemblage was supplemented with three papyri. Um, and it's here that we get the narrative about Gawit Session's titles and roles within the temple, as well as information about her family, right? So it's in these ways that a personal identity can be preserved when you can't trust that it will be preserved in a tomb or even on the coffins in which you are buried. Now, third, I'd like to connect the family to the temple. And to do this, I want to take you back in time just slightly to what's going on in the Ramesid period. Now, what we first see happen in the Ramesid period is the royal family places a great emphasis on extended members of the royal family in a way that we haven't seen before. Prior to this, in the earlier New Kingdom, you really just had a focus on the king and, and queen, but royal princes were never shown just simply by virtue of their birth existing in, in this royal sphere. They, all, they had military titles or priestly titles, so we know who some of these individuals were. But um, it's really in the Ramesid period that members of the royal family, simply by virtue of being royal, kind of grew in popularity. Now, as you can imagine, what starts out in the royal sphere often trickles down into the elite sphere. So we see elite families um, really starting to emphasize their own family connections and lineages. And we can see this based on tomb information. So the number of named and titled family members in tombs grows significantly in the Ramesid period. And those titles that they have shift from titles that connect them to the king to titles that connect them to the temple. And I think this is very important, that as kingship is weakening throughout the Ramesid period, 
these elite individuals say, okay, I need to connect myself to a more stable institution than that of the king. And where do they go? They go to the temple. Right? And so because of this, temple titles grow in popularity, they grow in diversity, and they become more hereditary. People want to hold on to those titles and pass them down to their children. So here we have an example of what this looks like on a papyrus. We have the deceased Padiamun, and on his papyrus, three previous generations of his family are listed, his father, a grandfather, and a great-grandfather. And if we look at the titles, it, it makes sense that in the papyrus of Padiamun, his titles would have the most real estate, let's say, right? So he has the most, right? He's the God's father. He's the beloved chief of secrets of heaven, earth, and the underworld, the opener of the doors of sky of Ray and Karnak and secrets of heaven and seas. What is in it? He is a great seer of Ray and Atum and Karnak, a priest of the horizon, a priest of Amun, right? But if we look at what his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather are titled, um, they share, a lot of positions within those temples, indicating that this is now a hereditary position, and if Padi Amun had a son, it would go presumably to him. This is also an interesting narrative because, okay, yes, I said that Padi Amun would probably keep the most real estate for himself on this papyrus, but there's a narrative in Egyptian uh, history where you always want to achieve more than your parents, right? And so I think this is also kind of what's going on here, that he's showing he was more successful, right, than his parents and his predecessors before him, right? And, and you know, that's something that we often see happen in autobiographical texts and funerary, uh, you know, autobiographies. They'll say, you know, never, never did anyone achieve more than I did in this particular situation, right? So that's a common boast that we see. Uh, here's another example of a woman, Tayu Harit, and she lists a mother and a father on her, her papyrus. Um, and again, you can see she shares titles with her mother. Now, these are com very common titles for most women of the 21st dynasty. But in addition to being a chantress of Amun and a mistress of the house, she did also become a chief singer in the choir of Mut, which is a little bit more and prestigious of a temple title for a woman. She also lists her father's titles. And I think this is not that she or a, a female member of her family would consider, you know, being able to pass those titles on to another generation of living children. But if these titles had any type of physical property attached to them or land granted to them, this might be something that you want to make sure you're including those titles in these funerary papyri because they may be passed onto living descendants if you can prove a continuity of, of a family member holding on to those titles, right? So she, she has a lot of titles for her father. Some are shown here, some are shown in other, other places on her papyrus. Now, of course, the big question that we all have and, and will always have when it comes to these documents is, is, is this a reality or is this simply a selective presentation that the deceased and the deceased's family, living family that are burying this person, uh, wish to perpetuate, right? So this may not be an accurate uh, depiction of all titles that the deceased or relatives of the deceased have had, but just the ones that they feel are very pertinent for this document that they want to, want to include. They could also be dramatizing their achievements, um, you know, a, a lot in these documents. Um, the last thing that I want to look at with you today is women and how women are utilizing papyri in unique and interesting ways. So, as you can probably already expect, the temple titles that are preserved are more diverse for men. Right? Men have many more positions within the temple that they can fill. Those positions are often ranked, so we know a hierarchy of who is more important, who is subordinate. Women have fewer options. Right, Most are simply a mistress of the house and a chantress of Amun. But what we see are that women seem to be comp compensating with this lack of diversity in their roles within the temple with more content included on their funerary papyri. They seem to include more spells, uh, more esoteric 
uh, knowledge in certain ways. And, and they're longer than men's papyri on average. And I believe that that's to contain all of the, this additional material that they seem to have over their male counterparts. Um, interestingly too, if you look at the family that's being recorded on men and women's papyri, they both seem um, to utilize the titles and identities of male family members on their papyri. Women tend to highlight their mothers more so than men, and, and okay, perhaps you know, gendered studies uh, would suggest that that makes sense, uh, ha women having a connection to their mothers slightly, uh, slightly more than the men especially when it comes to the inheritance of titles, where you would not expect a woman to inherit her father's titles, but maybe you would a mother's if she had um, special titles within the temple. But very interestingly is um, the seeming unimportance of spouses for both men and women. Um, for women in particular, right, we might assume that a relationship to a husband would be important, but it's not really reflected in the papyri as such. Now, this could be because of the time period that I'm studying, right? At the beginning of my presentation, I told you that we are now uh, burying family members in discrete burial assemblages that consist primarily of the coffin and these papyri, or the coffin set and these papyri, right? You're not getting a tomb that is meant to be shared by a husband and wife as, as more traditional in other time periods of Egyptian history. And so everything that the woman is buried with really is her own, right? And she's not able to rely on the burial assemblage of a husband in the way she maybe would have if they were going to be sharing a tomb with all of the burial goods intended to go to both of them, right? And so because she's now not able to rely on anyone, um, perhaps that connection to the husband and list listing that connection to the husband is, is not as important. And it's, I, I'm very happy to say that in the time period that I study in the data set that I work with, it is a almost perfect 50-50 split between the assemblages of men and women. So we have equal representation in the assemblages for men and women during the 21st dynasty, uh, which is really the first time you see that in Egyptian history. In, in all previous time periods, the funerary assemblages tend to skew more towards male-owned assemblages with women then being incorporated into those burials. Right? Um, but secondly, the inheritance of male titles right, um, might have come with the inheritance, as I said earlier, of physical property and wealth, making those aspects of inheritance of listing you know, parents, grandparents, and then so presumably to keep that trail intact for your living children. Right? That is the thing that needs to be much more um, controlled and emphasized. Right? And that too could be the reason why women stress the titles of male relatives like a father father, less so the husband, right, if they're actually trying to maintain those lineages through the generations. Um, so in conclusion, it seems that in addition to the written identities of the deceased, there's much to read in between the lines in terms of position and titles and ownership related to the family and social status maintained um, by continued references to these relationships, right? So men and women stress their own titles individually, but with more titles focused on fathers rather than mothers. And this might be a reality or it might skew um, towards family dynamics to make it look like the deceased was more successful than his or her parents. Um, inheritance could also have played uh, an important role in all of this for living descendants of the deceased. Um, they could have chose to stress those hereditary titles to ensure that they, they would inherit, the, the, that their children would inherit those positions. Um, and remember, this could also be accompanied um, by the inheritance of physical property or land, which families would have really wanted to control. Um, and so in this way, this very pragmatic way, uh, these books of the dead functioned for the living as well as the dead, securing these positions within the temple system in Thebes for generations. So thank you so much for your time and attention.
All right, I, I want to get started just in interest of time. Um, first, uh, let me begin by thanking first and foremost Sarah Cole, not only for inviting me to be here today, but also for putting together this, this wonderful exhibit that we all have the chance to enjoy. Um, I, I'm extremely pleased here to be. I'm extremely pleased to be here um, to help inaugurate this exhibit, um, especially in an event called the Egyptian Book of the Dead for the Living. And I think this this kind of subtitle is it shouldn't be taken as a throwaway line, and it's incredibly important. Um, and, and in a few regards, first, um, just because when we go and we experience objects in museums, they are not really objects; they are not really static things. They are actually doing things. We are interacting with them. We are creating interpretations. Um, some of them maybe that speak to us, but really maybe aren't super historically accurate, others that are really historically accurate and hopefully also speak to us. Um, but all of these are still very valuable experiences, and I think we can all kind of feel this when, 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 when you enter a space like this. Um, secondly, I think uh, what's really important about this for the living element is that, of course, as both of my previous co-panelists have mentioned, that these were actually compositions for the living as well as for the dead. And um, Marissa demonstrated this nicely in terms of kind of the social context, and Foy demonstrated this uh, very lovely as well um, in terms of uh, how these spells could also be used by the living and how they very much were informed by the world of the living and that they were really compositions for life, whether they be this life that we currently stay in or uh, the life post-mortem, it was still life. So my goal today in my talk is to expand on, on these ideas a little bit, um, particularly the kind of more conceptual ideas mentioned um, by Foy's talk in the, the, first, the first talk that you heard today. Um, and first and foremost, to bring the Book of Dead out of, out of isolation. Um, how did these spells, how did these utterances, how were they part of daily life? How were they similar to other aspects of daily life? Um, and how did they operate within the larger system of Egyptian thought and practice? And to do so, one of the things I'd like to stress today is that a lot of times when we talk about, you know, we talk about religion, we talk about magic, we talk about medicine as very separate categories, that they're kind of, maybe they, they intersect but only in problematic ways, but for us that these are really conceptual or different conceptual spheres. For the Egyptians, this was not the case. Um, and perhaps also I'd like to speculate on how this is maybe not the case as much for us as we like to pretend it is. Um, but uh, for the Egyptians, these were really all the same type of practice. They all used the same methods. They all used the same vocabulary. Um, so to, in order to demonstrate this, I'd like to, of course, start at our Book of the Dead, um, and then move uh, slightly out of the mortuary realm towards kind of maybe more magical practices, then into medicinal practices, and then hopefully back into the realm of the dead, but from a perhaps a different perspective and, and to bring a different viewpoint to the table. Um, I also just want to mention that at some point in this talk, I will be showing mummified human remains. Um, so if that's a concern for anyone, I just wanted to, to make you aware. All right, so why don't we begin with the most famous scene of the Book of the Dead, that of the weighing of the heart, um, which was also mentioned in the first talk. Um, of course, this is uh, Book of the Dead 125, as it is often identified, and you can see here, this is kind of one of the most famous papyri, one of the most famous examples of this scene, the papyrus of Ani that is now in the British Museum. Um, and here you can see, just to go give you a quick summary, you can see the, uh, the, the deceased and, and his partner all the way on the left um, approaching the Hall of Two Truths where this, this weighing will take place. Um, you have on the left side of the scale is the heart, on the right side is the feather. We often call this the feather of truth and justice. Um, that, I'd say, is only one part of it. The other part of this truth and justice is um, subservience, obedience, and essentially knowing one's place. So it's truth and justice within the system, very much. 
Um, so again, it's, it's not this kind of very high-minded, moral, morally superior, timeless kind of conception of justice. Um, and so basically, uh, the, the heart is being weighed against this feather, um, and it's being overseen by the god Thoth, uh, the figure uh, with the, the ibis head, who's recording kind of the, the events that, that happen. And then um, there's this little creature with a one-third crocodile, one-third leopard, one-third hippopotamus called Amamet, this, literally the swallower. Um, um, who will eat your heart um, and make you truly dead uh, should you not have been, uh, been honest or, or not have in, behaved according to Maat. And then should you be successful, then you're ushered in, this is from the same papyrus, you're then ushered in um, to the presence of Osiris, where not only do you enter into his following, but in true kind of the, the multifaceted and kind of multi-perspectival realm of Egyptian religious system, you also become Osiris. So... In this way, if we just kind of, or if you looked at this episode in isolation, you might say, wow, this is kind of the judgment after death. This is a very familiar tradition from other monotheistic or from monotheistic religions as well. This is not something that's totally alien to us. Maybe even it is known best from the realm of scripture even. Um, and maybe that would be where it would end if not for the ending of this text. Um, and again, this is often called a colophon, a kind of basically something addended to the end, um, but I think uh, one of the things that has been demonstrated previously is that this is actually just a, a really critical element of the text, and so I'm going to read this for you now. So, quote, what should be done uh, when being present in the hall of two truths? A man should say this spell, in other words, Book of the Dead spell 125, when pure and clean, dressed in clothing, shod in white sandals, painted with black eye paint, anointed with the finest myrrh oil. Now make for yourself this image in drawing upon pure ground. And as for the one whom this book is done, he will flourish and his children will flourish. There shall be given to him many good things. And then this is followed by lots of other benefits. And again, it's, these benefits could take place, again, in life, whether it be this life that we are currently existing in or the next life. So again, when we keep in mind the conclusion of this text, you see that it's really, it kind of, all of a sudden, it doesn't just look like simple religion anymore. It looks like we're crossing the line into magic. Um, and again, this is because these two conceptions were the same for the Egyptians. In fact, magic, well, while we think of magic maybe as a bit transgressive in a religious context, or it might be um, something that uh, kind of goes around established religion, uh, this wasn't the case for the Egyptians. Magic was a key part um, of the religious system, and this was a key aspect of creation that was used by all the gods and those on earth that knew how to use it as well. Now, let me give you another example of this, and this time not from the Book of the Dead, um, but from a separate papyrus um, and a story that, again, I think I'll tell it to you and it will seem rather like a myth. And this is the story um, of Isis and the secret name of Ra that is currently preserved on a papyrus uh, that is now in Turin. And basically, this, this story tells of kind of how Ra was, um, Ra is the king of the gods, um, but he's getting a little old, and he drools once in a while, but he's still very powerful. Um, and he's powerful because he has this secret name, this name that has magical efficacy that is hidden from all the other gods. Only he knows it. And one day, um, you know, he's, he's kind of wandering about, and he drools a little, and uh, another god who is known as being very effective with magics, uh, Isis, she's following behind him, and she sees this kind of spit fall out of his mouth, and she thinks she comes up with a clever idea. So she takes the spit, and she takes a bit of clay, and she makes herself a clay snake. And the spit animates the snake, and it comes alive, and it bites raw. And immediately, Ra is in extreme, extreme pain. And he kind of basically tries to cure himself. He's not able to cure himself. All the other gods try to cure him, but they're not able to do it because, in fact, it is Ra who has injured himself because it was his spit that has been used against him. So only by knowing his secret name would someone be able to cure him. So this is very clever of Isis. So she says... Um, well, you know, I, I will cure you, but only if you tell me your secret name. And when he can bear it no longer, he does. She cures him, and then Isis goes on to be one of the most magically powerful deities in the entire Egyptian pantheon. 
Now again, the story as I've told it sounds very much like a myth, um, a story about the gods perhaps maybe to glorify the cult of Isis, to explain her prominence. Um, but again, the ending to this text makes it very clear that this is not kind of a just-so story or a story just to kind of recount deeds among the gods. And so here is the ending of the story. And it says, words to be recited over an image of Atum and of Horus of praise, a figure of Isis and an image of Horus drawn on the hand of the sufferer and licked off by the man. Do likewise on a strip of fine linen placed on the sufferer at his throat. The plant is scorpion plant ground up with beer or wine. It is drunk by the man who has a scorpion sting. It is what kills the poison, truly effective, proved millions of times. <laughs> So again, this whole story is being told not to just kind of tell a, a lovely tale about the gods, but to aid someone, either one that who is suffering from or perhaps a practitioner who is aiding one who is suffering from a scorpion sting and to cure them. So this is now, we're now kind of entering, so this, this again might seem like pure magic and the intersection of magic and religion, but now we're able to bring in that third key term, which is medicine, and how medicine is part of the same conceptual sphere and operates in very, very similar ways. Um, because again, this is the kind of thing that actually you do to cure a scorpion sting. You could even use it prophylactically to prevent scorpion stings. So all of these are possible. Now, you might say, okay, well, this is just clearly, yeah, I, I, see, I see maybe there could be a, a medical side of things, but I don't really see, um, you know, all, all, all the intricacies of, of medical practice. Well, let me give you another example. Um, this is a, uh, a, a, an object called a kippus of Horus, and again, this draws on that same kind of Isis mythology. You see um, Horus the child, who is in fact being, at this part of his life, hidden uh, from his, his uncle, or sometimes brother, uh, Seth, in the marshes, and anyone that spent time in marshes or kind of, you know, very swampy areas can tell you that there's a lot of creepy crawlies. And um, especially uh, for a young child, these can be extremely dangerous. Just as, you know, if you have a dog in Los Angeles, you need to be extra careful when taking one for a walk. And um, so this is actually a medical object. And basically you have these texts and these texts describe, um, you know, the, the healing power of, of the child and maybe some elements from, from this uh, mythic cycle. Um, but this is the kind of thing where if you were suffering from a scorpion sting, I would not want to go up to this and very carefully read out the spell out loud. Um, these are difficult texts and they're tiny and I'd be in extreme pain, not my first choice of things to do. Um, so there was a way around this. How you could actually utilize this object was by pouring water over it. Um, just as Foy had mentioned that you could swallow spells in order to make them effective, so also you could swallow this medicine to make it effective against scorpion stings. There's even uh, kind of, you could collect the area and that flat area at the bottom um, and then drink it and the water would have absorbed the healing power of the text. So, but again, lest you think that all of uh, Egyptian medicine is purely kind of from this more magico religious side of things, um, this is not the case. We also have uh, medical papyri. Um, here at the top of the slide, you can see an example from, um, uh, from the Edwin Smith Surgical Papyrus, which is our earliest known um, uh, treatise on surgery preserved to us. And, um, and a lot of times when, you, when we have medical texts like this, you'll see them doing things that we know have real medical efficacy. For example, um, often using honey or uh, honey as an antibacterial. But then they'll pair this with something uh, that I think would be more surprising to us, like uh, sacred crocodile urine. And I, I, th I think I'm not an, a medical expert or an expert on urine here, but I, I'm pretty sure that urine actually does have some disinfectant qualities. So, so there is still, you know, it's not purely in the direction of myth, but there is some kind of combination of medical and, um, and meta-medical knowledge or meta-medical practices that kind of come together to really form a holistic view of medicine. And again, to show you really the, the true intricacy and advancement of the system that was ancient Egyptian medicine, 
I want to turn to this, this second term uh, that I have on the slide, um, this kind of, this term that for a long time no one really knew what it was. It was called wehedu. But actually, this, ter this, this, this term plays a central role in Egyptian medicine and really demonstrates how the ancient Egyptians came up with at least the first system that we know of, of a comprehensive system of aging, disease, and death. And it's, a lot of it is based on this substance. Um, basically, the, the way that the Egyptians per, uh, conceived of the body was as uh, the interior was kind of a network of tubes, starting from your head and then, again, coming out at your, your anus. And uh, through these tubes, all the kind of liquids of your body would flow. But as you aged, as you got older, and as you ate food, little bits would be left behind in there. And these little bits were called wehedu. And over time, this would accumulate, um, and gradually it would start to poison you. And when it reached a certain threshold, you could get seriously ill or even die. And if this sounds um, similar to kind of the modern idea of plaque kind of clogging your arteries, um, I, I think that's, that's actually very clever on the Egyptians' part. I think this is kind of, there's, there's certainly parallels here. Um, it's also funny that this explains the idea to kind of flush out this wehedu. Um, if you read kind of uh, classical authors that are engaging with ancient Egyptian medicine, um, they say the Egyptians are some of the most healthy people on the planet. And they, make, they do a lot of enemas and they do a lot of douching. Um, and this kind of explains why. They didn't really have an anal fixation. There was a legitimate medical reason behind it. But now I'd like to kind of make our, start making our way back to death a little bit. <laughs> so we just said that that over time, the wehedu could build up and poison you. Um, but the wehedu wasn't distributed equally throughout one's body. It was concentrated in some places, specifically the internal organs. Um, and so if these internal organs with a lot of wehedu, it was really hard to get rid of this. Um, so if you left these in the body after death, um, then they could continue to allow the body to decay, continue to kind of fester in there. And again, as we just were saying that uh, kind of, you know, the Book of the Dead is about life. Um, the body is important for kind of any aspect of that life in ancient Egypt. So, so preserving the body is really important. So one of the things they did was that they took out the internal organs where there were concentrations of this substance and they mummified them separately. And then they put them in canopic jars. So this explains why you have canopic jars in Egyptian tombs. This, of course, this example is, of course, uh, from the tomb of Tutankhamun. Um, but again, lest you think that this is an exclusively medical practice, you also had gods that watched over each specific mummified organ. Um, these were the four sons of Horus. Um, sometimes here you can see that. Um, the, the heads on the jars are human heads, but you can also sometimes see that there'll be a human head, a baboon head, a jackal head, and a, a falcon head. Um, so again, there is this kind of, um, there is this religious dimension, this magical dimension still there. But of course now, that this also explains mummification. Mummification was not a kind of spooky Halloween uh, trend or one um, that was kind of a, a hubristic trend to kind of preserve the body of specific individuals, but it was based on medical science. It was based on the first comprehensive theory of aging, disease, and death. So next time we are, you, you, know, you interact with mummified human remains, I hope you appreciate it not just as kind of a you know, an object of titillation or fascination, or um, I hope you do engage with it as a person, but I also hope that you engage with the, the vast knowledge and the, the, the medical sophistication that has gone into uh, the, 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 the continuous existence of this person. This is not just a magical or religious practice, it is a medical practice as well. So, in this talk, I hope to, again, have taken you full circle. We started off with the Book of the Dead, talking about it as a religious object, and then kind of maybe more of a magical object, and then talked about Egyptian medicine before finally returning once more um, to the realm of the dead, and a kind of well-known Egyptian religious practice associated with the dead, but hopefully now from a scientific, a medical point of view. 
So again, this demonstrates that where we see separate categories, the Egyptians did not. And what I love about kind of, what I love about studying other cultures, what I love about studying especially ancient cultures, is that I think this is a very lovely way of illustrating kind of different human ways of conceiving existence. Um, once again, though, perhaps not as different as we might think. Um, I can think of two examples from recent memory of kind of how medical knowledge alone is not enough. Um, the first is just kind of living in Los Angeles, um, or you know, you know, not to throw LA under the bus, of course, uh, but uh, you know. It's not uncommon if you're suffering from something, you might go to a doctor and you might seek a healing crystal. You might seek um, an essential oil. You might seek plants that have, again, proven medical efficacy, but would not be prescribed to you by a kind of signed, a very rigidly defined scientific system. Um, the other way that we see kind of this, the, the lack of satisfaction with the disenchantment of a kind of purely medical way of viewing the world has been um, kind of the, a lot of the shocking reactions to uh, disease um, from, and, and advice taken from medical, given by medical professionals that we've seen rejected over the past few years. Um, so lest we think that these are things that we do not do, we are very much still doing this and they're very much still part of our society. So again, it's not, when we say that the Egyptians conceived of their world differently than we do, this is not a distinction of ancient versus modern, and it's absolutely not a distinction of kind of advanced versus primitive. It is just kind of a, a, a different way of looking at the world. And again, I, I like this because it is a general reminder to not assume a monolithic human experience and to not assume a monolithic human perspective, but that by seeing kind of the diversity of human practices, only when we do this can we really see the connections uh, between cultures and between individuals. So thank you. So for our second panel this afternoon, our first speaker is Dr. Rita Lucarelli. Dr. Lucarelli is an associate professor of Egyptology at UC Berkeley and faculty curator of Egyptology at the Hearst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. She is presently working on a project aimed at realizing 3D models of ancient Egyptian coffins decorated with the Book of the Dead. And she's completing a monograph on demonology in ancient Egypt. And her specialty is the study of ancient Egyptian magic and religion. And our uh, second speaker in the panel is Heba Abd El Gawad, who is an Egyptian heritage and museum specialist and a research fellow at the Institute of Archaeology, University College London. Heba specializes in the history of Egyptian archaeology and contemporary Egyptian perceptions and representations of ancient Egypt. And together with Professor Alice Stevenson, she co-developed the Egypt's Dispersed Heritage Views from Egypt project, for which she was selected as one of the 21 most influential Egyptian women in 2021, recognizing her community work in the heritage sector. So please join me in welcoming our second panel of speakers. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I also need to thank uh, Dr. Sarah Cole and Getty for the kind invitation to be here to speak about uh, a topic very uh, dear to me, which is the Book of the Dead in general, but in particular, those guardian figures and the doors they are connected to uh, that appear in some of those uh, spells. And by now, I think you know everything about the Book of the Dead, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's challenging to talk after uh, my amazing colleagues who have been uh, really, uh, I learned a lot uh, as well from their conference, but I'll try to uh, tell you something new indeed and focusing on this uh, um, uh, specific spells which are spells uh, uh, 144 47 in the numeration of spells of the book of the dead and they're very popular they appear a lot not only on papyrus 
uh, as uh, Foy and other uh, speakers before um, uh, pointed out, uh, the Book of the Dead is attested on a variety of, of media. And when I started working on the Book of the Dead, that was a long time ago in Bonn, where we uh, worked at this uh, Book of the Dead database, mainly um, focusing on papyri, on uh, uh, papyrus sources. Uh, since then, I realized how uh, interesting is to look at the same spells attested on other media, not only uh, coffins, but also uh, tomb walls and uh, even temples. And so today I'll try to make a connection on how these spells in particular are used uh, on papyrus and on other media. And um, indeed, um, temples are for the living, tomb, coffins, papyri are for the dead, why the same spells are used in uh, different contexts. And so looking um, at the spells, you can see here um, two um, screenshots from uh, a facsimile of uh, a papyrus, as, um, which has been used uh, a lot from the beginning of the studies of the Book of the Dead, the papyrus of Yue Fang, um, kept in uh, Turin. Um, and you can see here the, those uh, um, uh, spells where uh, gates are represented together with their guardians. In particular, here you see spell 144 and 147, which are uh, um, the spells of uh, one type of gate, uh, so-called arerit in singular, arerut in um, uh, plural, and those gates, or they've been translated as approaches, as doorways, or um, um, doors. Um, the, the Egyptian term is very specific, indeed, of ancient Egypt uh, and uh, ancient Egyptian, and is attested also uh, not only in funerary text but also for uh, buildings in text uh, describing buildings and so also temple buildings. So. Um, those gates uh, are guarded by uh, a triad, three uh, figures of guardians, and I will return them, uh, I will go back on that, um, on those figures, but first I wanted to show you also the second uh, typology of um, uh, doors, which are called instead the sebehut, and they are characterized by having just one guardian. And those have been really uh, among my favorite spells ever in the, in the old collection of Book of the Dead spells because I was really intrigued by these figures and by what I like to call in my upco upcoming, upcoming book on uh, demonology, uh, real doorscapes. Uh, those are territories represented made of doors, of passages. And uh, we could uh, talk a lot about the, the meaning of, uh, of a gate, of a door, that is a liminal space, is a, is a space of transition. Um, those uh, gates of the netherworld, of the so-called duat uh, in ancient Egyptian, de definitely have um, a strong function as places of passage, as liminal spaces. They need protection, but there is a connection to uh, also, the, um, another important concept that is the concept of uh, justifi justification and uh, judgment that we have been uh, talking already a lot. So these are, these are a facsimile from uh, a papyrus where you can see the, the gates, the guardians, and the text uh, accompanying those vignettes, those images, where the names of the guardians and of the gates are uh, described. And um, if we want to consider those figures of guardians as demons, that's something that can be debated because in many of these texts, those are called natural gods. But anyway, those are are, let's say, demonic figures in the sense of a diamond uh, as a, a liminal being, as a, as a, a being that is connecting uh, uh, humankind and the, the, the great gods, so the gods that we know better, Osiris, Ra, etc. So if we uh, see um, those figures uh, as, um, as demons, we should also uh, try to understand uh, why those demons are so often represented um, 
while many other demons in other uh, Egyptian texts uh, are not at all. And I think it's because uh, in the Book of the Dead, um, those, uh, the, the deceased needs to really visualize and see all those inhabitants of the netherworlds that he's going to encounter. So those demons or those guardians need to be really well described and the doors as well. And all those doors, all those passages have names as well. So they are personified. And it, at least for me, it's really fun to read this text because of the variety of those names associated to the demons and to the doors. And if, I, if someone doesn't know which names uh, are attributed to the doors and which one to the guardians, they could be interchangeable. Basically, they are all names that speak of the agency of those places and of the guardians in the netherworld. And to show you how uh, those spells and those images uh, apply not only to the bidimensional object uh, that is uh, the papyrus, but also to a three-dimensional space, which could be a sacred space, a tomb or a temple. Here is an image of one of my favorite tombs ever the, with me. Uh, this is a very recent photo. I was there last month, so I talked to you some pictures of my last trip in Egypt. Uh, this is the tomb of Senegem in the Real Medina, uh, Luxor. And, um, oops, okay. um, and, and this is to show you like me in the tomb is to show you how tiny is this space. Uh, it's a vaulted burial chamber completely decorated with uh, a selection uh, of uh, funerary magical images, uh, most of them from the Book of the Dead. And you can see here uh, the guardians of one of those spells uh, with, within their doors, within their gates. Um, and um, if we think that um, the, the, this tomb de decoration was not supposed to be seen after the tomb was sealed, um, we are still, every time I think that we enter an Egyptian tomb, really astonished by seeing the, the, the level of detail that they were um, really taking in uh, decorating the old space, the full space. And this is because in the, the, the power of image in ancient Egypt and how all these figures and all this text, if we consider text also as images, uh, had really an effective power. They, they were, um, the old decoration was meant as a protection. And today, thanks to technology, uh, digital technology, we can even unfold those spaces. And so my colleague um, at UC Berkeley, um, Hani Farid, a professor of computer science, many years ago uh, kind of uh, made this um, um, unfold the tomb of Senegem uh, in, in order also to correct uh, the, some sort of perspective aberrations that you have when uh, you are in this vaulted space. Today, of course, we can also have uh, virtual reality uh, visualizations of tombs or other buildings. And in fact, I'm working to one of, of those uh, virtual reality applications in which I'm bringing back uh, a sarcophagus uh, to a tomb, but that's for another lecture. Um, what uh, here I wanted to show you is how those figures of guardians uh, really um, uh, are placed uh, in uh, this protected space of the tomb and uh, the selection of, um, uh, of scenes uh, that maybe you can recognize some of the scenes from the Book of the Dead that has been uh, mentioned and discussed before uh, are uh, all scenes that uh, speak about uh, um, something that is living in the tomb. Um, some some uh, figures, uh, all the figures uh, have an agency, so they they are living images. Okay, not uh, they're not images indeed for uh, um, for uh, for the dead only, but they also for the living. And this is the scene also of the. Uh, final judgment of uh, one of the papyri of this exhibition that has been already um, mentioned and uh, we have seen also in Foy's lecture. And this is uh, to connect indeed the, the theme of uh, protection of the gates of the doorways 
to the idea of uh, purity and final judgment. Um, this connection between uh, Spell 125 and the team in general of judgment and justice and the gates is really strong. And here I quote just one passage from uh, Spell 125 speaking of the importance of purity. So Inek Wabra, uh, Wab Awis, how we will, we will pronounce it, uh, um, I'm pure of mouth, pure of arm. Uh, so this need of purity uh, is, um, it, it also um, needs, um, uh, require protection. Uh, the not everyone can enter uh, pure sacred spaces. And so to protect those spaces, you need doors, you need guardians. And we see this association of the scene of the final judgment or anyway of uh, spell 125 of the Book of the Dead with the spells of the guardians and their doors uh, also on coffins. The, there is a series of coffins where, of course, the, the surface of the co coffin is uh, um, less extended than a papyrus scroll, at least the long papyri, so they had to select themes, text, and images. And on many coffins, you can see how if they had to select some Book of the Dead uh, spells, they would select the final judgment scene, sometimes with the text of the, this negative confession that has been mentioned, and this, the, an abridged version of the spells, uh, some of the spells of, on the guardians and their doors. An example is the beautiful outer coffin of Paddy Amun, kept in Liverpool, um, where um, we see indeed the, the scene of the judgment uh, and the text of the negative com, uh, confession on the exterior lid. Um, and uh, here the, the photo is a bit small, but um, you can see on the exterior side of the uh, coffin, uh, the guardians uh, with um, inside their gates and the deceased with Padia Moon represented uh, in front of them is uh, approaching the gate and telling the guardians, I know you, I know your name. And this um, conception of this secret knowledge or uh, um, uh, privileged knowledge that the deceased has, thanks to the spell, is something really important in, the, in this kind of text. You need to know those guardians, you need to know their names, how they look like, you even need to know the name of the doors. Uh, another example of uh, coffins where uh, the, the scene of the judgment is connected uh, to protective figures of gods, guardians, is actually um, one of the coffins uh, kept... Okay, this, uh, yeah. this is just a screenshot of uh, uh, the animation of a 3D model that I realized for my Book of the Dead in 3D project. And this is a beautiful coffin um, kept at the F uh, Fibers Museum in, uh, um, at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, and um, unfortunately, we don't have much gallery space, so all those beautiful coffins are in storage rooms. And digitizing them, creating 3D models, is a way to share them uh, widely. And it's a beautiful coffin. We don't have time to really describe the all uh, decoration, but it's clearly the, the sign of the judgment in the middle with the <coughs> different protective figures, guardian figures and gods all around. And by the way, um, I'm... I'm cu curating a very small, tiny exhibition on ancient Egypt at the Hearst Museum that hopefully will open soon, and this will be one of the coffins in view, uh, belonging to a man called UFA. Uh, again, uh, always uh, talking about still uh, justification and mummification, and those guardians that act also as judges, uh, I was looking at later documents, uh, not properly Book of the Dead, but um, the Book of Breathings is a sort of uh, latest development of the Book of the Dead. It has a lot of Book of the Dead themes, uh, images, uh, and re-elaboration on some text, like, for instance, Spell 125. Um, in particular, in this papyrus, which has been edited and um, published by Mark Smith, um, an Egyptologist, uh, at Oxford University, there is uh, a very interesting description 
of um, uh, some guardian deities or uh, judges in this case that um, have that looks like the guardians of the Book of the Dead. And uh, I want to read the text, but oh, where do I have it? Because well, I read it from there. So going forth from the hall of the righteous, so the hall of the two truths will be the the place of judgment, O gods and goddesses of the hall, O watchers who guard at the doors of the underworld, saying their name in peace, one with the head of Bess, another with the head of a lion, another with the head of a jackal, another with the head of crocodile, and then serpent, uh, baboon, ape, falcon, phoenix, uh, ibis, uh, um, scarab, mat, and I, I thought uh, they protect his ba living forever and ever. I thought this text is really interesting because uh, those hybrid figures with the human body and um, animal head uh, are actually the, the bodies that we always find um, represented as guardians in the spells that I showed to you before. Uh, we have the addition here of Mat, the, the goddess of truth that is central to the judgment, and uh, in um, in the uh, figures that in the image uh, that uh, the sketch that accompanies this text, uh, we see also four of those guardians represented. So there is uh, clearly here a connection between uh, uh, justification, uh, protection, mummifications, and uh, judging judges seen as guardians, guardians seen as judges, and. Uh, this association between mummification, justification, has been, uh, by the way, also already made uh, by Ian Asman and also then discussed by uh, Mark Smith. And I really believe that uh, it's really central, such an association, also in the Book of the Dead. And this is also why those spells on the guardians are so popular on papyrus, on coffins, uh, in tombs. Uh, uh, and we will see they appear also in temples. And so here just uh, screenshots for, from a study of Malcolm Mosher, who's been uh, working on a comparative uh, um, analysis of uh, uh, late period Ptolemaic papyri, just to give you an idea of uh, uh, how those uh, Arerut and Sebehut uh, are represented and the guardians uh, in the gate or uh, near the gate. And my impression is that uh, the Are route were sort of uh, more open approaches, uh, gateway. Um, and indeed, uh, chapter 144 opens this sequence, and 147, which is another variant also on the Are route, closes it. And so, if we want to imagine uh, this netherworld made of doorscapes, I would say that the Arirut would uh, include the Sebehut. The Sebehut are uh, closer gates with uh, just uh, one guardian in it or uh, beside the, um, uh, the, um, the portal or the door, how we want to call it, while uh, um, we have three different guardians in the, um, for the Arirut. Here is an example of text uh, for uh, um, those uh, accompanying those uh, those images. So, spell 144 on the Are route. You can see uh, this uh, the uh, the agency uh, very uh, uh, clear in the names of those uh, beings. Uh, so, the three uh, guardians of the Are route. Uh, um, they, they have specific functions, by the way. Uh, one uh, uh, is uh, a keeper, an eerie, another one is uh, a sow, a guard, and then we have a reporter. And indeed, we, can, we could do connections also between uh, this sort of protection and judgment uh, occurring in the netherworld with what, what has been... Um, called by Egyptologists uh, as uh, justice at the gates. So we found text where it seems that the temple gates were also used for uh, uh, judging uh, uh, people that were accused about something. And so you can imagine the reporter is the one that hear, and uh, the guard is the, the real guardian, and then the keeper is more connected 
to uh, the specific space of the of the door. And so names as the inverted uh, of face, so the many shaped or many formed one, the overhearer or the loud of voices uh, or the four stretched, uh, stretched uh, the angle faced or bla the blazing one. Uh, um, the translations of these names are not easy. Uh, most of those names are composite participial forms uh, and uh, um, if you look at translations of the Book of the Dead, you will find many different translations. Sometimes they don't even make too much sense. So it's interesting uh, uh, also from our perspective, uh, try to understand how to trans translate those ancient names uh, to uh, really recreate the agency of those beings. Uh, uh, from uh, Spell 145, uh, you see the make a way for me, I know you, I know your name, what I was telling you about, the importance of knowing uh, those figures, and uh, names like Lady of Quaking, Lady uh, Toll of Ramparts, Mistress, Lady of Trampling. Um, this is this is actually the name uh, of the of the door of the gateway, but you can see it could apply also to to real beings. So those are personified uh, passages. Uh, the doorkeeper in this uh, the first sebehut uh, of spell forty one hundred forty five is called the fearsome one, um, and so. Trying to interpret those names, try to understand their agency is what I was, I'm trying to do also in uh, my book on uh, uh, demonology or what we could call, I, I, I prefer to call those beings agents of uh, protection and punishment. So sometimes it seems their names uh, really have uh, punishing functions, other uh, function, other times uh, they, they speak about uh, protection of the place and of course of the, uh, the deceased who pass by if it's related uh, to a space in the netherworld. And more names here, uh, the one who stretches out his bro or one with vigilant face, uh, the hearer, uh, the, the radiant ones. So generally in those names you see the references uh, mainly to the face uh, or to something that this being can uh, actively do. Um, and it's interesting to, to know this uh, agency in the name, but the, uh, our, the, um, our static instead are the figures of those uh, uh, guardians represented often with mummified body, so similar to Osiris, the, the mummified god, the god of the dead, and uh, holding attributes, very often they are knives, but sometimes they are also vegetal elements, uh, so maybe speaking about abundance, um, and um, they don't seem to be uh, really moving around, they, they, they're really static uh, uh, figures compared to other demonic beings uh, represented instead or uh, descri described in spells uh, for, uh, uh, for the living, uh, magic for the living uh, that walk around or wander around. Those figures are instead really stable and uh, static. They don't move around, but their names uh, are really speaking of uh, them performing. And the idea of uh, a guardian that is also a bit of a judge, so it decides who can go through, uh, who is the sinner, who is not, uh, is actually not only Egyptian, and probably you're really familiar with the uh, images uh, um, representing uh, the hell in the divine uh, uh, comedy of Dante Alighieri. This is uh, one of my favorite ones where you see the, those devils the, um, uh, devouring uh, the, the dead. Uh, but those, um, those inhabitants of uh, the Christian hell are also guardians and judges, and you can see it a lot also, uh, for instance, in the Book of Watchers. And so we have uh, uh, demonic figures guarding places, being judges, and uh, living uh, in the netherworld. So their uh, place of belonging, I would say, is the netherworld. On the other hand, they appear also in other places. So that their uh, 
place of protection, I distinguish a place of protection from a place of belo belonging of those uh, beings. And the place of protection can be indeed the tomb, uh, or can be the body of the deceased when they are depicted on uh, bummy bandages, uh, or could be uh, a temple. And this is another image from uh, Senegem, but those spells are um, also occur in uh, Egyptian temples. Um, um, the most stunning of all, I think, for the depiction of those, uh, um, those guardians and the gates is the Temple of Dendera, um, Temple of Ator in Dendera, uh, where um, uh, we find uh, six Osirian chapels on the roof of the temples. And those chapels were devoted to the so-called mysteries of Osiris, so ritual for uh, the vigil of the mummified body of Osiris, and then uh, um, the protection of the body um, dur during uh, the stage before rebirth. And so here, those are my photos also from uh, my last uh, trip last month um, in Egypt. And you can see the entrance uh, to one of these chapels, the one uh, where uh, the spells on the guardians are attested is the second uh, uh, Western chapel. Uh, they've been uh, edited um, by uh, Sylvie Coville in a splendid edition where you can find uh, all the facsimiles. As you can see from uh, the photos I also I took recently, um, the, um, the texts are still um, readable, but the, many of the images have been defaced because those temples were then um, uh, that's, um, used and um, a bit ruined also by uh, the Christians in Egypt uh, who were seeing these figures as devils or uh, demonic, so they were carefully reeling, uh, defacing uh, and um, uh, deteriorating the body of those figures. They were leaving the text intact because they didn't think the text was dangerous, but the images were scary to them. Mm -hmm. So these poor guardians, which I actually find very beautiful, not scary at all, uh, have been really uh, ruined. But um, from uh, um, the edition of Sylvie Coville, but also if you have a chance to go to Dendera, you, you could uh, also note if you compare with the version of these spells on papyrus, how um, those who have uh, been working at the um, decoration of these chapels um, have selected only the vignettes of the spell, so the images of the guardians with, uh, with, the, uh, with the gates, and uh, um, a few captions as text, not the old spell. So definitely they talk that the names, uh, so the captions were with the names of those beings uh, and the gates. Uh, they talk this was the most important uh, part of the spells to, um, uh, to have in the temple. And um, already oops, in, um, in an article I published a um, um, while ago and that I'm now reviewing, I've been, uh, uh, I tried to analyze the, all those names of guardians, uh, how they appear in, on Book of the Dead Papyri, uh, in the Second Western Chapel in Dendera, uh, but also in a ritual papyrus. Uh, that is not a Book of the Dead, but contains spells of the Book of the Dead. So those spells indeed were used in different contexts, not just uh, uh, in traditional Book of the Dead. And so you can see how um, many of those names remain the same from uh, when they were copied uh, from the papyrus version to the uh, temple um, walls uh, and in the ritual papyrus. These are all, by the way, late uh, sources. Um, so others changed a bit, and um, I try to look if this change were just corruptions because they were not understanding the name, or if they were creatively giving uh, another uh, name to to those guardians. Um, it's, it's still difficult to understand how they were uh, uh, deciding uh, um, about that, if they were just copying uh, or not understanding or creating uh, new, new names. Um, and so uh, to sum up, um, 
I just wanted to stress out how the, um, those, funct those doorways or doorscapes, as I like to call them, have a, a main uh, function of a protection but, and defense from danger, but also they are related to the idea of judgment and justice. And so those door guardians, uh, gods or demons, as we want to call them, are real agents of uh, protection, and, uh, protection and judgment. So here is another image uh, always from the, the temple. Here again, I was very happy finally to, to see those images on which I've been always working on facsimiles, but uh, like, uh, finally I could see the real um, source. And uh, yeah, I thank you for uh, your attention. First of all, I'd like to thank Sara and everyone at the Getty for the invitation. And uh, it means so much to me being here. This is my first ever trip to the US, but it equally means more to me that I'm here to reflect on contemporary Egyptian views of the Book of the Dead or contemporary Egyptian views uh, on ancient Egypt, something that is usually overlooked and one could say dismissed. Um, and this gratitude means that I have to equally acknowledge, as Sarah has acknowledged in the beginning, the land, but I need to acknowledge the wider Egyptian communities that I'm here to be just a single voice of. I'm not representing the whole of Egypt. It's very easy to see one Egyptian and think that I'm the voice of all Egyptians. I'm not. <laughs> I'm trying to do my best because I acknowledge uh, their right and the rights of the wider Egyptians to contribute to the knowledge production of their past and to define how they see their past and relate to it uh, in ways that are suitable to them. Um, I'll start with the pyramids, something that the most captiva captivating architectural element in the world, one would say, but the inspiration here to use the pyramids is because this is something that we're all used to it in a way, we all know it, we all reflect upon it, but um, the uses of it are very different within modern Egypt. How the Egyptians, the modern Egyptians, use it is very different, and I'll show why. And I'll, I'll show you why. This is usually the image that we have of the pyramids in an academic publication or in a travel guide, or even how you would have it as a landscape image at the, as a backdrop for any display within museums. That's, uh, but this is not how the pyramids looked like. Neither for the ancient Egyptians, nor for you, for us in contemporary Egypt. Usually, these are very busy spaces, uh, not only by tourists, but equally by school visits, families enjoying their times there. Rarely has the landscape been frozen, as how museums and academic disciplines tend to freeze ancient Egypt in time and place, or perhaps freeze Egypt in time and place. You are always meant to see ancient Egypt as a frozen uh, monument, rather than a living heritage that still interacts with the contemporary community today. So equally for us in Egypt, when we want to attract tourists, we tend to fit into the same very Western fasci fascinating image of Egypt as the pyramids. And usually what I do is that I run things through our, my Egyptian family WhatsApp group to see if, how the other Egyptians feel about it. We're a big family, like most Egyptian families. So the first commentary that I would have would that we're not all ancient, which is what the image says. We're not all young. Not all the Egyptians look like this. We rarely ride camels every day. But equally for us, Giza is where is the zoo, because we call the area of the pyramids simply the pyramids area. We never refer to it as the Giza plateau. So that's equally problematic, because when you say see you in Giza, I would see you where the zoo is, not where the pyramids are. So it's, it's quite confusing for us, but it does work for the tourism. But. This is also a different way of seeing Egypt. This is how Ahmad Nabil, uh, a modern Egyptian photographer, who for him, he felt that the pyramids bring him um, feelings of self-defeat. In Egyptian Arabic, if you equate yourself to an undergarment, that means you're very belittled, you're embarrassing, you're an embarrassment. And growing up in Egypt, you are always, um, you're always being compared to a very glorious past that you can never match to, that you can never live up to, and it is defeating. 
it's equally depressing. And for him, this is how he sees himself compared to the past. He's very belittled, he's just an undergarment uh, in front of the pyramids. But this is how another modern Egyptian photographer, Hossam Abbas, he sees the pyramids. He sees them as they come on the top of the multi-layers that make, that make up the Egyptian heritage or the Egyptian identity. We are a multiplicity of ethnicities, multiplicity of cultures, and that, that is what makes us Egyptian. We're not just Arabs or not just Muslims or only Coptics or only um, Nubians. We're Egyptian, and sometimes by being Egyptian, you are all of these at once. But there is equally the pyramid of crisis. The pyramid of crisis was a graffiti that was uh, painted on the walls of Cairo during the Egyptian revolution in 2012. And why I chose this image to show you, and I'm using the work of Hane El Degham also to signify how there is, how we Egyptians see ancient Egypt and there is how sometimes people want us to see ancient Egypt. So for example, during the revolution, when there was the many graffiti artists, there was so much fascination with how the Egyptians used um, ancient Egypt in graffiti, but when we used the exact very same motifs from the ancient Egyptians, when we simply copied from the tombs of ancient Egypt to the wall, that it became, people were amazed by the graffiti work. But reflecting on this, this is a pyramid, but the pyramid of crisis. And here she signifies the socio and economical crises uh, that we live in as Egyptians today at the time and sadly still today. But most importantly was how she centers women in the middle of all of it because usually they are the ones carrying all the socio-political and socio-economical burdens of the many crises that a country, uh, our, our country went through. So there are many pyramids there is no one pyramid that is everyone's pyramid. There are many pyramids and there are many meanings for the pyramids, just as is the case with the Book of the Dead. And uh, today I'll just show you a few examples of how contemporary Egyptian artists have been using uh, the Book of the Dead, vignettes of the Book of the Dead, that some examples of which uh, exist at the Getty. They, are, they did not use the actual Getty examples, but they are similar vignettes to what exists here. And we'll try to reflect together of what this should mean to us today. So while the judgment scene, as we've seen today, was um, something to take you to the afterlife, but for Hana Ed Degham, it was a sign of resistance, because for her, in a mural that is currently held at the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, where she was commissioned to produce one, you could see the mural here, I think, in video. It's magnificent, and if, you're, and if you're ever in Berlin, I would invite you all to go and see it in the Revolution Gallery. And it has the revolution sign, uh, sound behind it. For her, the judgment scene, as you would see here, this signifies the time when those in power would come to justice, when they would, uh, when they would be judged not only against their heart, but equally against all the people that they might have done harm to. There would be the multiplicity of Egyptian voices uh, coming and signifying or perhaps responding to the negative confessions that the confessions that the dead would have to make. So if he, if he comes and says that I haven't stolen, all the Egyptians would come and, stay, would come and say, no, actually you have stolen. So this would be your, your, her, or her way of countering the narrative of a judgment scene. The judgment scene for her is very important. It's very sim symbol, uh, like, it's a very important symbol of ancient Egyptian heritage that she tries to use in her art, but for her, it's a way to bring Egyptians to justice. It's a way to signify for the social justice that she hopes for. You could see the ancient Egyptian motifs, as, I, as uh, I'm saying, but equally with the contemporary Egyptians. But she used it to signify how this is a struggle of minorities everywhere. Uh, minorities of all ethnicities, of all nationalities, of all kinds. So you would see a refugee lifeboat here in the middle. That was equally an important narrative in Berlin where this was situated. And to produce this piece of work, she invited Egyptians who live uh, in Berlin to go and write commentaries. So you would see some other graffiti that is not just her graffiti, but other uh, iterations, like some writings here. These are of actual Egyptians who visited the gallery just before she made the painting, and they've responded to the, to the theme of a judgment day, as how they saw it in the Book of the Dead. And this is what came out of it. Hanet doesn't 
only rely on the Book of the Dead, but she uses other uh, symbols from ancient Egypt in a way of her to counter the Egyptological narrative, on a way to perhaps reclaim what is ancient Egypt and what it should mean to us today. So this is just to showcase the signs. But she equally uses it um, as a symbolism for the two boss that you would see there, and they are the two souls uh, that are doing the adoration for the sun god Ra, or for the sun. She uses these motifs as a way to resist how the Egyptian identity is perceived or is represented. So she chooses, again, women as the center of uh, the image or, or the, port the portrait that she's got there, who, again, they are carrying ancient Egypt on uh, a bust, an ancient Egyptian bust, as you can see on the top there, above the head. And it has the Arabic, the Egyptian Arabic word, uh, infigar, which is explosion. And that this is what it would lead to after all the socio-economic and the injustices that women in Egypt and perhaps maybe everywhere <laughs> around the world, but of course I'm biased, um, uh, the, many, the many of the injustices that they have to carry. And this, she felt that this injustice or that this weight could be signified in ancient Egypt because she feels, as how I feel as well as many Egyptians feel, that ancient Egyptian um, heritage for us, or the world sees it as a responsibility that we have to protect for the rest of the world, but not a right, that not a cultural right that we are meant to enjoy and find ident identity from or within. So that was her way to protest the way we are seen. Um, another use of the Book of the Dead has been to redefine the Egyptian identity. Um, we 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 are going through an identity crisis, and I think we've been going through identity crisis throughout all, all our lives because of the many um, colonial waves that we have encountered from ancient times up till present. And we're usually reflecting, reinventing our identities. And for Iman, another visual artist, Iman Hassin, that is part of her artwork on display. And she felt that she uses ancient Egyptian motifs, particularly she finds the scene of the deceased sad, um, be it a king or be it just an average ancient Egyptian dead seat, uh, seated before the judgment, was her way to signify of her Egyptian identity, the way she sees herself as an Egyptian, the way that this is a journey, a journey to identify yourself. And, um, if you could see clearly, she had it by day and by night. So the one to the, uh, to the right <laughs> would be the night, uh, the night scene, and the one uh, to the left would be the day scene. So again, using the symbolism of going forth by day, coming uh, back by night, as inspiration for her art. Another inspiration would be for the solar journey and the boats that would usually be carrying uh, the deceased throughout his journeys. And this is something that Gamel Basuni, another visual Egyptian artist, and for him, it's how he thinks that ancient Egypt is an inspiration for many sciences that exist today. And he felt that the geometry that was used to create uh, the boats was his way of creating Again, another ge ge uh, geometrical um, interpretation of the very same boats, but for him it was a proof that contemporary Egyptians as well have some contribution to be made. Not only the past, but still the present has a contribution to be made to the world in terms of uh, the art in the interviews that I've made with him. This is why he, he relies very much on ancient Egyptian motifs and he mixes them with contemporary motifs, but just to show that there is a modern reinterpretation of the art uh, or a wave of um, revival of the art going on in Egypt. It's not only in the West. Not only the Egyptians who live in Egypt are struggling to identify their Egyptian identity or are using ancient Egypt to redefine how they see themselves and see the world, but equally um, Egyptians in the diaspora. So this is the work of art of Jackie Milad, and this is inspired by the Book of the Dead that is currently um, hosted at the British Museum. So Jackie, she is Egyptian um, American artist. She's based in the US. She's never lived in Egypt, but she was, her, her father is Egyptian and her mother is American and she was born here. For her, she finds an affiliation 
between herself and the Egyptian dispersed heritage all over the world that has been exported out of Egypt. So she sees this dispersed heritage as a representation of herself, of her dispersed identity, uh, being an Egyptian American and what does this mean to her. So she uses similar motifs and she makes her own reinterpretation of the ancient Egyptian motifs that existed on the vignettes of the Book of the Dead at the British Museum to create um, new works of art, but in her using her own words, a new identity for herself, to re-identify herself. The final usage that I think I would share with you today is the repurposing. And this is actually located in the beautiful West. So this is in Kurna, in Luxor. This is where the dead would be buried in ancient Egypt, but currently this is a very much living space with um, contemporary communities and rarely do artists, and I'm calling them artists because this is how they want to define themselves, the contemporary alabaster artists that work in the factories uh, of alabaster that exist in, in Kurna or mostly in Luxor today, creating copies that would be sold in the touristic uh, market, rarely are they perceived as artists. But for them, they feel that they are repurposing ancient Egyptian art to create not only an, a source of income for themselves, but to create an identity, an artistic identity for themselves in interviews that we've been having with them over the past few months. And they use the very same ancient Egyptian uh, modes of creating, of course, with some modern alteration. But for me, this sound, the sound you could listen, this is perhaps how it could have sounded in ancient Egypt. This is how an ancient Egyptian stone workshop could have sounded. And they are reliving in the same sound. This is not to say that between ancient times and present times there is absolute continuity. There has been developments, of course, and change. And as we can see here, the judgment scene that we tend to call, for example, in Cairo and Hane would call in Berlin judgment scene. In Luxor, it's called the courtroom. That's how they define it. That's how the artist who makes this piece of art, they would just define it as the courtroom. It's made in different modes. There are obviously some new interpretations in terms of color, but um, why does this not count as art? Why is, not, why is this just because it, it's in the tourism market, why is it of a lesser value? Why are these craftsmanship, why is the craftsmanship here? Why are the artists operating here? Just because they exist within the tourism industry or this is becoming where they mainly operate, why are they not perceived as artists? They usually make some um, shows or performances to touristic groups, but I don't think that this should take away from the talent and equally from the artistic contribution that they are making. They are even introducing new motifs that didn't exist in ancient Egypt, but something to signify for their talent that they are capable of making complex forms from a single stone, just like the ancient Egyptians, but they are making their own new reinterpretations of what uh, should count as art. And most of the time when they are creating uh, the artistic interpretation, they are actually making it from archival photographs. So there is a bit of scholarship in there. So this is not just something that should be seen as touristic, commercial. There is so much traditional knowledge that exists within these alabaster factories. To sum up, if we take this is the very same uh, scene, one used by Hane in Berlin. She's an Egyptian based in Berlin, and this is one used by an Egyptian artist in Luxor. They both found meanings in an ancient Egyptian motifs. It means different things to them, but this was a graffiti done by an Egyptian on the wall, that on the mural that Hane has used, and he's written that museums are sarcophagus of revolutions. Are museums sarcophagus of revolutions? Are we because we tend to deny contemporary Egyptian reinterpretations of the past, which is not becoming part of the knowledge production process? Are we sentencing them to death? Um, should, should we reflect more on why is this disenfranchisement between ancient Egypt and contemporary Egypt? Are all revolutions meant to be unfinished? Um, thank you so much.
Uh, I guess I'll ask the first question. Thank all five of you very, very much for exciting and stimulating talks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, they were so exciting and stimulating. I have two questions. I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. Um, so the, the first of my questions is for Dr. Scaife and for Dr. Stevens. Um, so the selection and the adjustment of certain of the spells in the so-called Book of the Dead implies some sort of authorial selection and agency. Um, and I was wondering whether we could talk a little bit more about where that um, authorial agency, the decisions about which spells to keep, which spells to um, throw away, which spells to write, and which spells to um, a to modify, um, whether that lay with the patron or with the scribe, um, and whether we can know anything about that kind of selection and writing process, and whether, whether these scribes have this sort of self-conscious and self-promoting um, uh, maybe agency in and of themselves. Um, and I, I would think that with the, uh, the titles for the individuals and for their families, there must be the, the agency must lie with the patron rather than with the scribe, but I, I am curious about where the uh, agency may have lain. Um, and my second question is mostly for uh, Dr. Lucarelli. Um, it's very interesting that the, uh, the threshold, the gateway to the, de the realm of the dead is represented typically as a door with a couple of posts and a lintel. Um, a door usually implies a wall. And um, after all, you don't usually have doors just inside of space in a Salvador Dali or Magritte painting or something like that. Um, so I was wondering whether the boundary between living and dead was conceptualized as some sort of a, a wall that you could conceivably bump against and whether this doorway um, being fairly narrow would have been conceptualized as, as a, a narrow space that could easily be guarded, whether there were possibly ways around the wall, whether there might have been windows in the wall like the uh, animals that are sometimes depicted there, there or other figures painted on these walls, whether those could be sort of seen as windows between the living and the dead or something along those lines. So sorry, I've talked way too much. Please answer the question. I guess I can, I can start to your authorial question. A couple of things. I mean, I want to make it simple and not take up too much time to answer it. I mean, the, the first thing I would say is largely, I would say we don't know. The process of the commissioning part where the patron would commission these manuscripts and what was in them, that's the least that we have more knowledge on. We don't have a lot of detail about how that happened. We know, for example, that some manuscripts were made as templates where they wrote out the spells and they left spaces where the owner's name and titles would go. So clearly those aren't being produced for a particular person at a particular time. They're produced and then the names are filled in later when the person would purchase that manuscript. In other cases, in fact, almost all, but not all, <laughs> all but one in the current exhibition, these were commissioned uh, and made uh, for a particular person. Their name was written in as the, the texts were written. So how that process worked and who was involved with saying, I want this spell or that spell, largely we don't know. But with that said, one interesting aspect of Dr. Stevens' corpus that she's working with is a lot of these people are priests themselves. And we do have certain cases where there's pretty good evidence that some of these priests made their own papyrus. So maybe the most famous is Nebked, right, is the one that we always talk about in the British Museum, where you have a quote-unquote draftsman scribe, a scribe who's a sort of illustrator, who is even depicting himself holding the papyrus in some of the illustrations in the papyrus. So in certain cases, and especially in Dr. Stevens' corpus, what you really see is that um, some of these people may have been in charge of writing their own or at least choosing some of the material that went in. But with that said, we see these changes over time and place. So a bunch of the stuff in a certain period, let's take the third intermediate period so that you can follow along from, or follow after this with the, the follow-up, a lot of the spell sequences and the spells that are being chosen are the same across a bunch of different manuscripts. They fall into like groups. So what that suggests to me is it's probably not an individual patron who says, oh, I want the spell, these five numbers, and then this one, and put them in this order. There's a workshop, and the scribes in that workshop have source material that they tend to be following and supplement. So just to give some examples, we think of like the Penugian papyri uh, as being really important influencers to other third intermediate period material. So it's a little bit of a long-winded way of saying we don't know all the details, 
Sometimes it's quite clear that the patron is very involved and where they have their own training, they may have even been directly involved in the production and choice of text. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything that Dr. Scalf said. And to that, I, I always just like to add an analogy, you know, because the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians are very much just like us when it comes to the purchasing of, of commodities today. So think of how we might purchase a car. Most of us maybe would go to a dealership and the biggest choice that we have is between like new or used, but we could go custom right, and go directly to a manufacturer and say, I want this type of a paint job and I want this type of an interior and really trick it out. So some people probably did that with their papyri. Some people maybe went to the lot and said, I'll take a new one. It's, it's not, it's not, right? I mean, sometimes it's, it, it's kind of hard to reuse papyrus. It's much easier to reuse things like coffins, but you could reuse a papyrus carefully, right? You don't want to you know, drill holes in it as you're erasing things, but it could happen. Occasionally, just like a car, it could be stolen, right? So like the whole spectrum exists for categories of ancient commodities as exist for our types of modern commodities that we have today. Yes, thank you for your question. Can, is this working? Yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, in, in fact, I've been uh, also wondering about those doors that, if you look at the images, seems like isolated in an open space. Where are the walls? And um, uh, my answer to that is that, actually, I had no time to, to say it before, but those guardians already appears in uh, earlier sources, um, so-called coffin text, but also in the pyramid text. They, but especially in the coffin text, they are represented, those guardians, floating around in space without doors. Then the doors appear mostly in the vignettes of the Book of the Dead. Still, you don't see walls. And, um, but when we have those images on the walls of tombs and also in temples, the, the optical illusion you have is that there is actually a wall. The wall is where the door is represented. Um, we, you can, of course, see a lot into uh, the, the layout of a papyrus as well. And I, I could even say, well, what about the text all around uh, those vignettes? Are those uh, ideal symbolical walls of protection? So uh, the fact that they anyway focus on the representation of the door is because uh, really the door is the symbol of uh, passage between two spaces, not really, I think, in this case of entrance in a closed space. That's another kind of door, let's say, of a building. But in this sense, uh, in this context, I like to, to talk about doorscapes because it really seems like we only have doors. And you can find those images of doors without walls, also in other funerary compositions uh, depicti depicted in uh, royal tombs, but also on papyrus in, on a certa, in, in certain periods later on, which are so-called book of the gates uh, or uh, the book of earth. Those are uh, um, also composition with a lot of gates and guardians in it. We're going to alternate and take some questions from our Zoom audience as well. Um, we have a couple of questions having to do with spells and the use of the word spell, as well as what happened in the 19th century with the development of scholarship around the spell. So there's a question about why we use the word spell to refer to these writings as opposed to something like hymn or recitation. And then can you speak a bit more about the 19th century scholarship that assigned numerical order to the spell and sort of the history of how we today think about and organize this material? Yeah, That's I guess I should, um, I should take responsibility for spell because I'm, I'm actually using the term consciously. Uh, and for me, I'm not using it, s sometimes in modern English, you might think it has some pejorative quality, right? That it has something uh, sort of uh, derogatory associated with magic. Actually, I'm using it in its longer etymological history. So in the same way that the word gospel came from good spell, right? Good tidings, that is good utterance. 
I'm using the English word spell in that sense. So I'll take a little bit of responsibility for that because I actually use that in my scholarly work as well. I, I like this term, uh, especially as, you know, if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary and look it up, um, it really is associated with utterances. So um, that's one reason I like to use it. I can let the other members of the panel elaborate on theirs. Um, but in terms of using some other terms, there are some other options. Him is probably not the best just because that gives you um, some conceptualization of the genre and each of these spells, these compositions, can have a lot of different variations in terms of their format. And hymns, we usually have a certain type of, let's say, poetic flavor to them, how they're addressed to, let's say, another being that would imply. So I wouldn't call them hymns because some are hymns and some aren't, right? So like spell 15 is full of hymns, but most of the other spells aren't really hymns. So I think in terms of the terms we might use, spells, sometimes people use chapters. That's what you hear, uh, especially in maybe some older scholarship. Um, I personally avoid that term only because of how it reinforces your idea of a book and you think each chapter is one to the next to the next and the Book of the Dead, the chapters didn't work that way. Um, but you could call them recitations, you could call them utterances. If you really want it to, I don't like this term because it does have pejorative notions too, it's like incantation. I don't tend to use that. But so I'm using personally the word spell with this longer English etymology, uh, just going back to again, good spell, gospel, uh, utterance. I don't know if anybody else wants to elaborate on their usage of that. And I don't want to monopolize, but we can also talk about the Lepsius numbers as well. But um, right. does anybody else have? I mean, maybe I'll just chime in to say that uh, if you look at the, the hieroglyphs that, that many of you so, so beautifully displayed on the screen, it's literally the word for what we're translating as spell utterance. It's an open mouth with a kind of a line under it to say like, yes, one of, one of these. Um, so kind of interpret that how you will, but uh, clearly it's something to do with, with speaking in some way. Uh, if I may add uh, to that, as uh, uh, an Italian who started to look at the Book of the Dead in Italian, so it, it's, I, I would say it's a matter of translation, and in English, spell, I think, is the word that maybe renders better the Egyptian Ra, which is actually the hieroglyph of the mouth, so it's something that is said to provoke something. Uh, in Italian, for instance, we, it generally is translated as formula. That is, also it has this implication that you're doing something with that. So <coughs> it, it's, the, it, it's not just a text, it's not just a saying. It, these are words that have an agency. So it's magic, it's what we call magic. We could talk also about what is magic, <laughs> but maybe another, yeah. another time. And then just to address the organizational part of the question, um, the numbers, right? How we've been referring to Book of the Dead, 15, 17, 125, all of those throughout the presentations, those come from Carl R Richard Lepsius, who in 1842 took w one of the most complete copies of the Book of the Dead at the time and numbered them according to that sequence. But as you've seen, that rarely, if ever, maps on to other copies, right? Occasionally you might have spotted, oh, 30, 31, 32. That's, those three appear in order in this copy, but then there's a big gap, right? So very, it became very clear to Egyptologists that there is no true canonical order, as, as Dr. Scalf mentioned in his presentation. Um, and then other numbers were then added. Naville, another scholar, added numbers um, later on because more copies of the Book of the Dead were found with additional spells that weren't preserved and the ones that Lepsius studied. And then to complicate it just even slightly further, because there are so many variations of these spells that, that we've all alluded to in, in our talks, you then have things like 15A, 15B, 15C, right? Because there's so many variations. But at what point do you determine something is a new variant versus just maybe a couple little changes here and there? So it becomes very murky very quickly. Um, I have two questions. First of all, thank you so much for such a beautiful way of describing such ancient knowledge. It's a very relatable and entertaining at some point as well. And my first question is has to do with how the Book of the Dead was created. 
in ancient time, they created a tomb when people still alive. You know, mm-hmm. the king take the throne, they just shoot, you know, she's sling on the tomb. This, mm-hmm. this person gonna die one day. So when it's come to the book of the dead, this is something that written, okay, that time about to come, let's write that book of the dead for this person. Or is something that writing over the years of the person that living. So that's my first question. Second question has to do with medical, spiritual and magic. So in, um, I know that Dr. Wintemi, like Mr. Mitchell can answer this, in, in a temple of Sobek, there's a carving on the wall that is literally illust- illustrated the medical instrument. And my question is, like, I went to all the different temples and Temple of Horus had this beautiful um, recipe of aromatherapy. And I'm just curious in terms of Temple of Sobek in particular, why is it had a medical instrument and what is the god Sobek has to do with healing and a medical and thing as such and magic, of course. So thank you. So do you want to- yeah, I mean, it is so. So your first question, you know, it, it's it's quite a good one because we don't have solid answers. I think as we've already discussed, some of these documents would have been specifically commissioned by an individual. At what point in their life did they do this? It's a bit unclear. Other copies of the Book of the Dead that could have been manufactured and kind of sold off the shelf, right? So that's that's a category that we could exclude from this discussion. But if you're commissioning a, a document, at what stage in your life would you do so? And that's it's very unclear. What's interesting is from the ones that I study, in terms of the titles that are preserved, it those are the most complete set of titles that an individual would have. So if you're comparing what they have on papyri, versus what is on a coffin that they might have owned. There are normally more titles on the papyrus preserved than on the coffin. Now, that's not to say that the coffins happen first. I think that is an issue of space, right? You can only put so much on a coffin, you have more leeway with a papyrus. Um, But it's very much unlike what we see with tomb commissioning from other time periods in Egyptian history, where you can see perhaps the first phase of decoration they had lesser roles within the temple or not as many titles. And then later on, they, in a newer section that was created in the tomb, you can see more, right? And even like one famous example is the tomb of Ayat Amarna. You can actually date when the rooms are decorated based on how many daughters Akhenaten, the king, has in the reliefs, right? Because as his reign continued and he had more children, all of the elites that were putting up images of the royal family were like, oh, now we have to carve four royal daughters. Oh, now we have to put in five, right? So you can, you can, you can measure it. And on a timeline, how long it would have taken and what rooms were decorated first. We don't seem to have that for copies of the Book of the Dead. I think maybe because they're more discreet, they they would take from start to finish less time. So I think these do kind of represent a, a more discreet snapshot in a person's career. But when that occurs is is truly a mystery to me. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in for the for the second question. Um, I'll start with the, um, the the room of incense, or kind of I think the perfumery, as, as you've mentioned it, um, at the Temple of Horus of Edfu, just because this is the one I'm more familiar with. Um, and this is essentially a room uh, where all the sacred oils, all the sacred incenses for offering in the cult would have been prepared. Um, and so there's recipes on the walls, presumably. These would have been used outside the temple context as well, maybe, for purifying uh, household spaces, domestic cults, things like that. Um, But we only have it preserved for us, and the formulas only come to us from the the temple context. Um, I suppose it's also possible, I'm speculating here, that there could have been something akin to um, the concept of the waqf, where you kind of have stores that are associated with the temple that people can kind of come in and, and purchase these things that are being used in the the cult as well, Uh, but then you can bring it home and the funds will go to the temple. Um, For the uh, material from uh, Kamumbo, from the temple of Sobek, uh, this is another late late temple. Um, And my knowledge of this is not as as complete as I would have liked, so others feel free to jump in. Um, But uh, I would say that there's probably nothing special 
necessarily about Sobek as a healing god in terms of like, well, why does Sobek a healing god versus um, versus Amun or versus uh, Anubis or something or versus Wapwawet? I think it's just that um, whenever you have a temple, the major god that the temple is donated to or is, is dedicated to always becomes the creator god, always becomes the supreme god. Sometimes you'll see this um, with Sobek, especially by being the syncretism with Ra, so Sobek Ra. This kind of signifies his kingship and his creator status, which then gives him kind of all the powers, but would give any god or goddess then all the powers. Um, one interesting shift that you do get. I, I can't remember if the the reliefs are Ptolemaic or Roman. Yeah, yeah, in the in the back. Yeah, Ptolemaic, yeah. Right. Um, you, you do start to, to see a kind of increasingly in the Ptolemaic period and especially in the Roman period, um, for most of Egyptian history, the priests were moving in and out of the temples um, where they were kind of doing some rituals and some kind of medical practices for the divine statues and then leaving and doing that uh, for practitioners in the local community. Gradually, especially because of, of taxation policies, um, this, this is stopped. Um, so this could have been uh, a way of kind of, ad, you know, not advertising their wares, but kind of, you know, uh, really kind of hammering home their medical expertise in the space where they were now practicing it now that they were not going out and back and forth into the community. Okay, we'll um, take another Zoom question, and um, there's one here for Heba. Um, this attendee says, first of all, thank you for a beautiful presentation. Um, and they're wondering, do we see Egyptian artists engaging with the texts and the actual knowledge and content, the spells of the Book of the Dead, in addition to the imagery and the symbolism? Uh, working? Yeah. <laughs> I feel I'm jinxed with microphones, but <laughs> yeah, uh, I think uh, there is one, there is currently one Egyptian um, comic artist actually, who's working on one of the papyri that exists in the newest museum in Berlin, and on the actual text, the many of the spells that, came, which is a Book of the Dead, uh, also papyri, and many of the spells on it. So many of them work not only on the images, uh, but equally on the text itself not only when it comes to the Book of the Dead, but other, um, other representations of ancient Egypt terminologies or wordings today. So it's, they are not only confined to images, but I felt that in the presentation it would be easier for the audiences to follow if I just follow the, um, the visual aspect of it because it's equally more telling than the text. <laughs> One more from the audience, I think. Hello. Um, my question is, is there a spell that you're familiar with that you think uh, would be um, resonant or, or instructive to uh, modern times for us to hear? Do you have a favorite spell? Because we've heard so much about them. <laughs> well, I, I, I gave the, the, the game away already by talking about spell 64, the spell for knowing all the spells in one spell. <laughs> but there, there's a lot of options, and you know you you should all pick your own. Um, and I hate to say that, but there's there's actually some that's not technically Book of the Dead that I get asked about a lot. Um, there's a cat spell to to heal your cat, and so people with sick felines that I know are always asking for, can I get the cat spell uh, so that they can save their cat? And in fact, um, somebody that I knew uh, they got the cat spell. This was maybe. 25 years ago or so, they were telling this, me this story. They got, actually got the cat spell from uh, my predecessor, uh, my, my advisor at the OI, uh, ISAC, where I, where I work, now work, Robert Ridner, and they used the cat spell and it worked, and they brought their sick cat back to health. Uh, so they always tend to continue to use the cat spell. So um, that's not in the Book of the Dead, per se, but that's a spell that everybody likes. Um, do you have a favorite? Um, yes, I have a, a few favorites, but... Um and they are generally those spells for warding off dangers that, that you know, I find really still useful <laughs> in particular. <laughs> and uh, well, my friend colleagues know that I'm, I'm not really uh, someone who is uh, feeling comfortable in nature, so like <laughs> snakes, scorpions, uh, <laughs> insects, <laughs> and so on. But there is one in particular that I like, uh, the, um, is a spell uh, to ward off the so-called upshy insect. And there is a colleague who wrote an article of 20 pages trying to understand 
what is this Apshai insect? <laughs> is a bug, is, we don't know yet. It's, it's like <laughs> something really bad, but it looks like a beetle. Um, and I like the fact that in some variants, uh, they transform this word Apshai in shy, that is actually the pig. <laughs> so the spell to word of this beetle, this insect, uh, becomes a spell to word of the pig. And I really like that. I say, like, they were genius. <laughs> you know, <that> was <laughs> for pi I, I don't have nothing against pigs, but... <laughs> 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 I mean, my, mine is also not from the Book of the Dead, but I believe the London Ma Leiden Magical Papyrus, so more along the lines of the medicine that, that uh, Jonathan was talking about. Um, but it's to prevent migraines, gestep in Egyptian. Um, so the ancient Egyptians did suffer from migraines as well, but you're supposed to write a magical a, a, um, text as well as an image on a, a strip of linen and tie that into seven knots and then wear it around your left ankle for 10 days and then you'll not have migraine. I tried it. It didn't work for me. <laughs> but, but, but so here's, here's the thing though. There's always, when you, when you have these types of prescriptive medical magical texts, there's always a reason why it may not go right, and that's the fault of the practitioner. So it, it never puts into jeopardy the authority and the efficacy of the spell or the text itself, right? So, so, so the religious aspect never gets called into question. It always is the fault of the practitioner. So I'm sure I did something wrong, and that's why it didn't work. Can I, I'll say one yeah. more thing, just yeah. to just maybe just for, I don't want to call in the motivation of the questioner uh, into, <laughs> into question here, but um, I'm actually working on a text that's really interesting that's a magic spell uh, to make someone horny for you. So I, <laughs> if, if you talk about modern relevance uh, and you need a tender date, you can always, uh, you can always pull that out of the hat. On that note, I, think <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hate to cut off a really fascinating conversation, but we're, <laughs> we're, we're now well past 5.30, which is our cutoff point for the program. Um, but of course, we can all continue this conversation at the reception, so please do join us, and please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers.